the excitement and enthusiasm of gold washing still continues, increases. From the California Star, dated June 10, 1848. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Many of our countrymen are not disposed to do us justice as regards the opinion we have at different times expressed of the employment in which over two-thirds of the white population of the country are engaged. There appears to have gone abroad a belief that we should raise our voices against what someone has denominated an infatuation. We are very far from it, and would invite a calm recapitulation of our articles touching the matter, as in themselves amply satisfactory. We shall continue to report the progress of the work, to speak within bounds, and to approve, admonish, or openly censure whatever, in our opinion, may require it at our hands. It is quite unnecessary to remind our readers of the prospects of California at this time, as the effects of this gold-washing enthusiasm upon the country through every branch of business are unmistakably apparent to everyone. Suffice it that there is no abatement, and that active measures will probably be taken to prevent really serious and alarming consequences. Every seaport as far south as San Diego, and every interior town, and nearly every rancho from the base of the mountains in which the gold has been found, to the mission of San Luis south, has become suddenly drained of human beings. Americans, Californians, Indians, and Sandwich Islanders, men, women, and children, indiscriminately. Should there be that success which has repaid the efforts of those employed for the last month, during the present and next, as many are sanguine in their expectations, and we confess to unhesitatingly believe probably, not only will witness the depopulation of every town, the desertion of every rancho, and the desolation of the once promising crops of the country, but it will also draw largely upon adjacent territories, awake Sonora, and call down upon us, despite her Indian battles, a great many of the good people of Oregon. There are at this time over one thousand souls busied in washing gold, and the yield per diem may be safely estimated at from fifteen to twenty dollars each individual. We have, by every launch, from the Embarcadera of New Helvetia, returns of enthusiastic gold-seekers, heads of families, to effect transportation of their households to the scene of their successful labors, or others, merely return to more fully equip themselves for a protracted or perhaps permanent stay. Spades, shovels, picks, wooden bowls, Indian baskets for washing, etc., find ready purchase and are very frequently disposed of at extortionate prices. The gold region, so called, thus far explored, is about 100 miles in length and 20 in width. These imperfect explorations contribute to establish the certainty of the placera extending much further south, probably three or four hundred miles, as we have before stated, while it is believed to terminate about a league north of the point at which first discovered. The probable amount taken from these mountains since the 1st of May last, we are informed, is $100,000, and which is at this time principally in the hands of the mechanical, agricultural, and laboring classes. There is an area explored within which a body of 50,000 men can advantageously labor. Without maliciously interfering with each other, then, there need be no cause for contention and discord, whereas yet, we are gratified to know, there is harmony and good feeling existing. We really hope no unpleasant occurrences will grow out of this enthusiasm, and that our apprehensions may be quieted by continued patience and good will among the washers. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. American Industry Abroad From the New York Times, dated January 11th, 1859 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. American Industry Abroad Americans and Their Inventions and Doings in Europe From Our Own Correspondent Paris, Thursday, December 23, 1858 In a late letter I gave you the history of the triumph of certain modifications in surgery introduced into France by American surgeons. I propose today to give you a resume of American industry abroad, giving the place of honor, on account of its extent, to dentistry. I ought to mention first, however, that Dr. Boyman's operation has been adopted so rapidly 
that it is declared by the best surgeons of Paris as the only operation to be practiced hereafter for the malady which it is destined to remedy, and we thus see a young American surgeon introducing into France, and at the great seat of medical science, a certain cure for a malady which the most distinguished surgeons of two centuries have sought for with but indifferent success. In their notices of Dr. Boyman's operation, however, the surgeons who have thus far lectured upon it have not failed to give credit to other surgeons who were more or less successful in the cure of the accident in question. Thus in Europe, Diefenbach and Jobert have been particularly successful in its treatment, Monsieur Jobert claiming to cure one-third of his cases by a very simple operation, while in America, Dr. Hayward of Boston, as long ago as 1828, performed the operation successfully, and to him is due great credit for the modifications he introduced. To Dr. Sims, also of New York, credit is given for his improvements in this operation within late years, while astonishment is expressed that Dr. Sims should so singularly designate himself in a public address as the instrument especially selected by Providence to discover a cure for a malady which had been already cured even in his own country while he was yet in his infancy. I ought to mention here also that the practice of local etherization by means of electricity is becoming general as well in surgery as in dentistry. It is felt that all that is required to generalize this practice is a better knowledge of the particular cases to which it is adapted, and of the manner of applying it. And regret is expressed by the French surgeons that they have not access to the experiments and the experience of American surgeons. I will not pretend to explain why dentistry in Europe is so far behind that in the United States. It is most singular that in France, where surgery and the accessories of the toilet have been brought to the highest perfection, the art of the dentist should have been left so completely in the rear. Until very lately the art was ranked among the lowest of trades. A dentist was, in fact, but a puller of teeth, and one of the commonest expressions in French is, even to this day, El men comme un arachot de dentis. He lies like a dentist or a tooth puller. It was not until American dentists settled in France that the art was at all respected, or indeed deserved to be respected. Mr. Brewster was the pioneer of American dentists in Europe. He settled in Paris in 1836 and soon became the dentist of Louis Philippe, the Tsar Nicholas, and other monarchs. He was bought out by Mr. Thomas W. Evans of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in 1850, who, with his brother Theodore, now continues the business. These gentlemen not only maintain the position ceded them by Dr. Brewster, but they have extended it. They are the dentists to the courts of France, Russia, Bavaria, Württemberg, and, I believe, of Belgium and Saxony. With such high protection it may be readily conceived that the practice of these gentlemen is immense. Besides the Legion of Honor granted to the elder brother by the Emperor of France, both the brothers have received decorations and rich gifts from the other monarchs by whom they are employed. They have just built on the Avenue de l'Imperatrice a private residence, which is an ornament to that new and elegant thoroughfare. Mr. James Fowler, formerly a partner of the deceased Harvey Burdell, afterwards established in Bleecker Street, New York, came to this city four years ago and went into business as a dentist on the Boulevard des Italiens in partnership with a French merchant by the name of Prater, the latter furnishing the funds for the establishment of the house. At the end of three years, however, Mr. Fowler sought and obtained before the tribunals a dissolution of the partnership, and at once established a new house in the Place de la Madeleine. Since his residence in Paris, this gentleman has made several pieces in gold for the replacement of lost parts, which excited the astonishment and the admiration of the Academy of Medicine and of the entire faculty of Paris. Among these were an entire lower jaw in gold with the teeth affixed, several upper jaws, obturators, etc. Although not new in America, it was the first time any successful attempt of the kind had been made in Europe and Mr. F. is now in the enjoyment of a first-rate reputation and practice. Mr. Prater obtained a workman from the United States of the name of Fowler, and is continuing the business at the old place under the name of Fowler and Prater. Mr. Horner of Philadelphia is a partner in the long-established English house in the Rue de Luxembourg, which now bears the name of Stevens, Watson, and Horner. This is the largest and richest dental establishment in the world, its income reaching $60,000 a year. Gold work, however, has only been introduced into this house since the entrance of Dr. Horner. Previously, their artificial pieces were made of hippopotamus and tire, and decayed teeth were filled with amalgams, the ancient French and English system. 
Dr. Gage, formerly of Mobile, has also established himself in Paris as a dentist, and like the other is doing a good business. Mr. Potter, an American dentist, who has practiced in Bombay and in Lisbon, has been for some years established in this city, and lately took into partnership a dentist of New York, Mr. Crane. Dr. Parmley, formerly of New Orleans, an elder brother of Dr. Eleazar Parmley of New York, has been practicing dentistry for three years past, upon children in the schools of Paris and London till an attack of typhoid fever, followed by partial paralysis, disabled him from the active pursuit of his profession. He continues to reside in Paris, however, and gives advice to families and schools in regard to the care of the mouth and young people. A gentleman who announces himself to the public as an American dentist, Dr. Koth, formerly of the United States, late dentist to Her Majesty the Queen of Spain, has established himself in Paris within a month. Dr. Koth, according to his circular, speaks English, German, Spanish, and Swedish, but judging from the doctor's name, we think he ought to have commenced his enumeration of languages with the Swedish. As I was passing rapidly in a carriage a few days ago through an obscure quarter of the Faubourg St. Germain, I had a hasty glance at a sign which had evidently just come from the painter's hands and which bore the words, Dentiste American, preceded by a name of the purest Gallic origin. So you see how the current is running. So widespread is the reputation of American dentistry that the teeth of nearly every monarch in Europe are filled, pulled, and replaced by Americans or Suedescent Americans. Thus, as I have already mentioned, the Evans of Paris are the dentists to the courts of France, Russia, Bavaria, Württemberg, and some other smaller states. At Rome, Dr. Burgess, an American, is the principal dentist. At Madrid, it is Dr. McKeon, another American. The principal dentist of Berlin is Dr. Abbott, of Bangor, Maine, while the court dentist is a German who studied in America and who calls himself, in consequence, an American dentist. At Vienna, where it is almost impossible for a foreigner to get permission to do business, Dr. North, also of the state of Maine, has rapidly gained the first position among the aristocracy, although he has not yet arrived at the court. When he first went to Vienna, Mr. North was obliged by the police restrictions from giving any publicity either by advertisements or by a sign at the door. While stowed away privately in the upper part of a house, wondering whether his enterprise was going to fail or succeed, he was one day surprised at receiving the visit of Prince Lichtenstein, who came to get work done. The American complained of the rigors of the police, and the prince said to him, Never mind the police. Take a house to suit you, put your sign out, and if they trouble you, come to me. Mr. North did as the prince advised. The prince sent his daughters and others of his relatives and acquaintances, and from that day the fortune of Dr. North was a fixed fact. He numbers now in his protectors not only the Lichtensteins, but the Metternichs and the Schwarzenbergs. In St. Petersburg, the aristocracy employed two Irishmen, brothers, who studied their profession with Dr. Brewster at Paris, and who call themselves American dentists. The principal dentist at Hamburg is Dr. Cohen, who studied in America and calls himself an American dentist. The brothers Tellender, who studied dentistry in New York, do the court and the principal business in Stockholm and Christiana, the capitals of Sweden and Norway. There are a few other dentists scattered through the German Confederation, Germans by birth, who receive their professional education in the United States and who call themselves American dentists. At London, Mr. Rann, an American dentist, has rapidly reached a large practice in exclusively aristocratic families. Another American, whose name I forget, has also arrived at a large practice in London. At Manchester, there has been an American dentist for a good many years. This closes the chapter on dentistry. Two American physicians are in practice in Paris, Dr. Bigelow of Boston and Dr. Ballard of Philadelphia, both graduates of the School of Paris. The latter gentleman, however, is of French origin. He was two years house physician in the wards of Dr. Trousseau at the Hotel Du. Both these gentlemen are doing well, but fortunately for the small American colony in Paris, their business is not confined exclusively to their countrymen. We have no American lawyer in Paris, although we need one, but we have two ministers and two places of worship regularly established. The chapel built by the Americans in the Rue de Berry last year continues under the pastoral charge of the Rev. Mr. Seeley. The Episcopalians, however, have organized a congregation and secured a place of worship in one of the upper rooms of the Church of the Oratoire in the Rue Saint-Honoré, 
From a dozen members three months ago, this new congregation has reached nearly a hundred. It is called the American Episcopal Chapel in Paris, and its pastor is the Rev. W. O. Lamson, late of St. Paul's Episcopal Church, New York. The number of American artists now in Paris is extremely limited. Mr. Kellogg is still occupied on Oriental subjects. Mr. White is painting a picture for the state of Maryland, Washington resigning his commission. Mr. May has a variety of subjects on the easel. Mr. Cranch has gone to Italy. Mr. Fagnani, the sculptor late of New York, has fixed himself permanently on the Champs-Élysées and is engaged on busts. Mr. Thompson, the American photographic artist and photographer to the Rothschild family, continues on the Boulevard des Italiens. An American daguerreotypist has lately established himself in the Rue des Faubourg Poissonnaire. Of bankers we have in Paris three American houses, John Monroe and Company, Lansing Baldwin and Company, and Green and Company. The latter house, which suspended two years ago, will resume business again the 1st of January at the Old Place, Place St. George, under the title of Vanderbrock, Green and Company. Since the Great Exhibition of 1855, several American inventions are manufactured on a large scale in France. Of these, the most important are McCormick's and Manny's Reapers, the vulcanized India rubber of Goodyear, which has acquired an immense extension and employs daily several thousand men. The sewing machines of Singer and Grover and Baker and Company, and of Wheeler and Wilson, Tucker's Artificial Marble, Pitt's Threshing Machines, Chamberlain's Cork Cutter, and a variety of other inventions. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The Dakota a description of one of the most perfect apartment houses of the world. From the New York Times, dated October 22, 1884. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. From the Daily Graphic, Wednesday, September 10th. Probably not one stranger out of fifty who ride over the elevated roads or on either of the rivers does not ask the name of the stately building which stands west of Central Park between 72nd and 73rd Streets. If there is such a person, the chances are that he is blind or nearsighted. The name of the building is the Dakota Apartment House, and it is the largest, most substantial, and most conveniently arranged apartment house of the sort in this country. It stands on the crest of the West Side Plateau, on the highest portion of land in the city, and overlooks the entire island and the surrounding country. From the east, one has a bird's-eye view of Central Park. The reservoir castle and the picturesque lake, the museums and the mall are all shown at a glance. From this point also can be seen Long Island Sound in the distance, and the hills of Brooklyn. From the north one looks down on High Bridge and the tall reservoir tower, which looks as slender as a needle. From the west can be seen the Palisades, the Orange Mountains, and the broad Hudson, which narrows into a silver thread as the double row of hills close together far away in the distance. Looking south, one sees the tall towers of Brooklyn Bridge, Governor's Island, and far beyond the green hills of Staten Island and the blue waters of the Lower Bay. Every prominent landmark in the landscape can be distinguished from this location, and the great buildings of the lower city are as prominently marked as if the sightseer were floating over the island in a balloon. At this elevation, every breeze which moves across Manhattan from any direction is felt. This is a feature which needs no emphasis to make attractive such stifling days as these. The building is of the Renaissance style of architecture, built of buff brick, with carved Nova Scotia freestone trimmings and terracotta ornamentation. Although there is a profusion of ornament in the shape of bay and octagon windows, niches, balconies, and balustrades with spandrels and panels and beautiful terracotta work and heavily carved cornices, the size and massive construction of the edifice prevent any appearance of superfluity. The building is about 200 feet square and 10 stories high, the upper two stories being in the handsome mansard roof, which, with its peaks and gables, surmounted by ornate copper work, cresting and finials, and relieved by dormer and oriel windows, gives the entire structure an air of lightness and elegance. The construction is of the most massive character, 
and the aim of the owners has been to produce a building monumental in solidity and perfectly fireproof. The brick and mason work is of unusual weight, the walls being in some places four feet thick, and the partitions and flooring have iron beams and framing, filled in with concrete and fireproof material. On the 73rd Street side there is a handsome doorway, and on the 72nd Street front a fine arched carriage entrance with groined roof and elegant stone carving. Both entrances lead into the inner court, from which four separate passages afford access to the interior of the building. From the ground floor, four fine bronze staircases, the metalwork beautifully wrought, and the walls wainscoted in rare marbles and choice hard woods, and four luxuriously fitted elevators of the latest and safest construction, afford means of reaching the upper floors. The ladies' sitting room, adjoining the staircase in the southeast corner, would be decorated by the Mrs. Greater X, a guarantee that the work upon it will be artistic and unconventional. There are four iron staircases and four elevators enclosed in massive brick walls and extending from the cellar to the kitchens and servants' quarters in the upper stories, separate from the rest of the house, which can be used for domestic purposes, carrying furniture, merchandise, etc. There are electric bells to each elevator and a complete system of electric communication throughout the house. The building is in four great divisions, which enclose a courtyard as large as half a dozen ordinary buildings. This gives every room in the house light, sunshine, and ventilation. Under this courtyard is the basement, into which lead broad entrances for the use of tradesmen's teams. Here are situated the most interesting portions of the building, or at least the most novel ones. The floor is of asphaltum, as dry and hard as rock. This basement, also, has a courtyard as large as the one above, and lighted by two huge latticed manholes, which look like a couple of flower beds in the stone flooring. Off of this yard are the storerooms of the house, in which the management will store the furniture and trunks of the tenants, free of charge. A porter is assigned to this duty alone. The rooms are all marble-floored, lighted and heated, and accessible at all hours of the day or night. The rooms of the servants are also on this floor. These consist of separate dining and toilet rooms for the male and female servants, and a male reading and smoking room. These are not for the personal servants of the tenants, but for the general help of the management, which will not number far from a hundred and fifty persons. The laundry, kitchen, pantry, and bake shops, and private storerooms are here also, for the owners combine a hotel with the apartment house, and furnish eating facilities for all the tenants of the building who prefer it on the table de haute plan. Opening from the lower court, and extending under the open ground in the rear of the building, a large vault, 150 feet long, 60 feet wide, and 18 feet deep, is now being excavated. When finished, it will contain the steam boilers, steam engines, etc., for hoisting, pumping, etc., and the dynamos for supplying electric illumination in the Dakota and adjoining 27 houses. The vault will be roofed with iron beams and brick-filling arches and made flush with the land in the rear of the building, 225 feet deep, which will be laid out as a garden. The boilers, with the furnaces, machinery, etc., will thus be located outside the walls of the building, safely remote. The first floor contains the dining rooms, which are finished in a perfect manner. In this case, these words really mean something. The floors are of marble and inlaid. The base of the walls is of English quartered oak, carved by hand. The upper portions are finished in bronze base-relief work, and the ceilings are also quartered oak, beautifully carved. The effect is that of an old English baronial hall, with the dingy massiveness brightened and freshened without losing any of its richness. The effect is heightened by a large Scotch brownstone engraved fireplace, which ornaments the center of the room. The business office has oral communication with every portion of the house, and the wants of the tenants can be attended to as quickly as can be done by human ingenuity in a perfectly arranged service. In addition to the four staircases mentioned before, which are finished in bronze and marble, there are four iron staircases for servants, four passenger elevators, and four servants' elevators. The Dakota will be divided into 65 different suites of apartments, each containing from four to twenty separate rooms, so that accommodations can be furnished either for bachelors or for large families. There is an air of grandeur and elegance not only about the halls and stairways, but also about the separate apartments that cannot probably be found in any other house of this kind in the country. The parlors, in some instances, are 25 by 40 feet, 
with other rooms in proportion, and there are in many cases private halls to the suites, furnished with fine bronze mantles, tiled hearths, and ornamental open fireplaces. The parlors, libraries, reception, and dining rooms are all cabinet trimmed, paneled, and wainscoted in mahogany, oak, and other attractive and durable woods, and are furnished with carved buffets and mantles, mirrors, tiled hearths and open great fireplaces and parquet floors. The kitchens are spacious and provided with ranges, with ventilation hoods, all with minton tiled facing and marble wainscoting. There are porcelain wash tubs, large storerooms and closets, and butler's pantries, equipped in the most complete manner, and each suite has its private bathrooms and closets, fitted with the most approved scientific sanitary appliances. The plumbing and hygienic arrangements are fully equal to anything in this country. On the top story are six tanks, holding 5,000 gallons of water each, and supplied by steam pumps having a daily capacity of 2 million gallons and about 200 miles of pipe have been used in effecting its circulation. Not only in the sanitary appliances, but in every other department, there is a completeness that is surprising. The precautions taken to secure proper ventilation in a pure atmosphere, to ensure safety to occupants in cases of fire or panic, and to extinguish fire, are perfect. When opened, the comfort and convenience of the guests will be further ensured by the accommodations of the dining rooms, laundry, and barber's shop, run to the most improved plan in connection with the building. It is the perfection of the apartment style of living and guarantees to the tenants comforts which would require unlimited wealth to procure in a private residence. The wisest precautions have been taken to ensure freedom from the ordinary cares of the household to the fortunate tenants. For instance, the coal and kindling wood are purchased by the manager in large quantities and sold to the tenants, who take in exchange for their money tickets which are presented at the office, and the fuel is carried to their rooms in convenient quantities, thereby saving the user from any of the necessary troubles in buying and storage. This may seem like a small matter, but it is only one of the hundred plans taken by the owners to secure the comfort of the tenants. It is almost needless to state that the building is as nearly fireproof as any which can be erected. There are continuous passageways extending through the four divisions on the roof, ninth, eighth, and first stories. On the tenth floor there is provision for a playroom and gymnasium for the children, well lighted and ventilated and commanding a grand view of the city and surroundings, while on the ninth floor there will be extra servants' rooms, private laundries and drawing rooms, dormitories for transient male and female servants and attaches of the building, and lavatories, toilet rooms, and bathrooms for their use. The work on both the Dakota and the neighboring apartment house and private dwellings owned by the estate has been done not only in the most careful manner, but with a view to permanence and convenience and to symmetry as well as beauty of appearance. The greatest skill and experience and the best materials large means could command have been employed, and the manner in which the work in each department has been done reflects the greatest credit on those entrusted with it, especially upon the architect, Mr. H. J. Hardenberg who has supervised the work from its commencement to its now rapidly approaching completion. Both the Dakota, the private residences, and the smaller apartment house are now ready for occupation, and we need hardly comment on the peculiar attractions they will possess for those who have experienced a desire for an eligible residence on the west side. The natural and artificial attributes of the position are all in favor of the buildings, which for comfort, ample space, salubrity, convenience, and accessibility cannot be excelled, and a glance at our description will suffice to show that everything skill could furnish, ingenuity and experience suggest has been supplied. The managers of the Clark estate, the owners of the property, are well known for their fairness and liberality to tenants, and every care will be taken to ensure comfort and well-being. The rents are moderate when compared with the accommodations furnished, and those desiring to secure either dwellings or apartments can examine plans, etc., and make arrangements at the office of the estate at number 25, West 23rd Street, New York. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. France's Gift Accepted From the New York Times, dated October 29, 1886. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. France's Gift Accepted, Liberty's Statue Unveiled on Bedloe's Island, A Great Holiday to be Remembered in This City, Magnificent Land and Water Parades, Imposing Ceremonies, and the Presence of a Great Multitude Mark the Occasion. 
Liberty. A hundred-fourths of July broke loose yesterday to exalt her name, and despite the calendar rolled themselves into a delirious and glorious one. At daybreak the city stirred nimbly and flung a million colors to the heavy air, for the cloud king had covered the heavens and moved upon the waters. But she plumed herself and showered, scarlet and snow, and azure and gold, defying the skies to darken her festival. Then streamed the people, convergent rivers of life, hurrying and sweeping through a thousand channels to the path of the pageant, there eddying or gathered or running counter to the onward tide, till the great thoroughfares overflowed and billows of humanity surged crosswise and splashed sprays of small boys to every ledge and cornice and accessible foothold, till the very lamp posts were crowded and the doomed telegraph poles creaked with their burden. There was no solemnity. The clerk of the weather had done his miserable best to make things gloomy and forbidding, but American spirit rose to the occasion, bubbling with enthusiasm and frolic, and would have none of the dampness thrust upon it by the changeful wind or the sloppiness beneath. By eight o'clock the plot thickened, and the blare of bugles, the jolting of caisson and gun, the measured tread of regiment after regiment swinging into line, the clash of arms and the captain's sharp cry, the throbbing roar of a hundred drums louder and nearer all spoke of busy preparation for the peaceful march of glorious war. And about this time the prevailing features of the scenery were drum majors and uproarious bands. It seemed to have rained brass bands during the night and hailed gorgeousness with no drainage to carry the surplus away. There were bands of seventy pieces and bands of seven, bands striped and feathered and zoned and trimmed and buttoned galore, not a square inch of plainness visible on any tooting Teuton from top to toe, bands somber and sad and thin, looking as though they had been packed away in a damp trunk some time about the centennial with no camphor, and had just emerged somewhat moldy and careworn and a little moth-eaten, but amazingly enthusiastic and discordant, bands from every armory, theater, and dance hall in the city, windy bands from Boston with vociferous horns, mild bands from Buffalo with a dropsical tuba that cadenced the march with immeasurably abysmal grunts, bands from Hoboken and Newark, each man throwing his whole soul into a different tune, bands from Sing Sing and Poughkeepsie and Newburgh, each man throwing his whole soul into no tune at all, bands from Albany that ought to have been poisoned or blown up on the way, squealing and wheezing their excited course through the maddened air, bands from Washington that could be heard a mile, bands from Philadelphia that couldn't be heard at all, and seem merely to be going through the motions, but doing their best, bands proud and bands humble, bands full and bands skimpy, they tooted and whistled and shrieked, more and more coming each minute, and still they came. And the drum majors. If there is anything in appearance, the pay of a drum major must be $64,000 a year, and he ranks the commander-in-chief. He is nickel-plated in his humblest places, and gilded and embroidered and furred the rest. Then baldric and belt and scarf and aguiletto and draped and girded about, and with baton and sword of peerless burnish he is dazzlingly complete. "'Where is the Major General?' asked the small boy. "'Dunno. Dare's the drum major.' "'Take the drum major in his pride, nine feet high and four thick and swelling as he comes. Nothing moves till he stirs.' The serried line is at rest, the captain's chatting, the men at ease. The horns big and little in the band are still, and the unwalloped drum is asleep. Suddenly the drum major stiffens. All is instant commotion. Ten shunt. Cree hump. The muskets are lifted together. Horns big and little are raised. A pause, and thirty puckers hold the band in a spell and the athletic gentleman with the buckskin potato masher prepares to administer a soul-stirring thump to the jumbo drum. The drum major lifts his baton. The puckers increase and apoplexy is imminent. He gives it a flip and a twirl, bang, boom, a wound, snort, rattle and bray from the horns altogether, and the pageant moves, for so the drum major has willed, and glittering general and staff, the prancing steeds and steady legions, the music and feathers and lace and flash of ominous steel, three miles of obsequious glory tread in his train. From the roof of the post office yesterday the scene was beautiful, bewildering and impressive. The very darkness of the day seemed but to make each color brighter, and the great street was gay from the teeming square to where it turns at the marble spire and is lost to view, a thousand flags and streamers, banners and devices pendant and glowing to brighten the scene. 
Thick as an angry ant hill swarmed every foot of roadway, and window and staircase and roof were crowded to see. Suddenly the clatter of hoofs and a sharp command, and obedient the multitudes parted. Then the flowing of that river of color and sparkle, brighter and brighter as it neared, the air trembling to the tones of sonorous brass, and the brigade strode proudly by, regulars in our own, with troops from sister states sending tribute to honor the day. Two miles of these, and then the societies of the children of France, then the judges and governors, the mayors, the veterans of wars whose memory we cherish for the heroes they gave us, the police of Philadelphia and Brooklyn, the carriage of the father who gave us liberty, knights of Pythias and Templars, and then amid a whirlwind of cheers, the volunteer fire laddies, red-shirted and haughty, dragging the precious relic of struggles and glories long dead and half forgotten. Like a comet, the pageant burned its way and swept seaward, dissolving like a dream. Then the wild rush for the river and bay, where the mighty statue stood facing the east. Sullen the sky and tumultuous the waters, but little cared they that went down in the ships, or they that thronged the sea-wall and wharf with expectant eyes. The clouds had lowered till the gray and gray commingled. From the battery the island and the statue were shrouded in mist. The hurrying thousands stopped and stared upon the driving vapor, then laughed and pressed onward to find ferry or tug or steamer or barge. Philosophers of the school of forethought brought rod and bait and tackle, ranged themselves along the string-piece, and merrily yanked the shining squilgy from the vasty deep. Adventurous souls chartered wary or dinghy, and tumbled about on the waves like a cockle, narrowly missing this paddle-wheel to encounter that, and earning many a frenzied pilot's blessing. There stole a white-winged yacht like a ghost, coming and vanishing and coming again. Huge steamers swept in stately silence to the main. Here, there, and everywhere moved the ferries and the passenger boats, whose machinery seemed perpetually reaching down into the cabin for something it never quite succeeded in fetching up, all black with humanity. Now lifted the brooding cloud for a moment and showed the ships of war, brilliant with bunting, pointing to the tide, the island, the waiting goddess, a hundred plunging tugs and speeding yachts and saucy launches, each a mass of flustering color, then the cloud dropped again and they were hidden. Unseen tugs bellowed hoarse warnings and were answered. Fog horns brayed from the crawling schooners. The throb of coming paddles was heard, and nothing seen but a gliding shadow. Now it pleased the skies to drizzle and wilt the enthusiastic citizen's collar and huddle him wherever shelter was afforded. Then a puff of sudden wind drove the comfort from his bones and invested him with a chill. It was dismal sightseeing by the water's edge, and strong rhetoric was in favor. Suddenly, above the signal shrieking of the watchful pilots, came a new and more maddening din. Something had broken loose and plenty of it. A hundred vessels lay beside the docks as dozing, the lazy smoke drifting listlessly and the engines still. Now all was bustle. Crowds hurried to the gangways and embarked. The hawsers were lifted from the piles. The pilots spun the wheel to starboard and blew a long and terrible blast. A hidden bell tinkled somewhere. There was a muffled roar and a beating of waters. The salt air took new vigor, and the waves rolled swifter and more darkly by. The city had vanished. Again the whimsical wind withdrew the veil, and the naval pageant startled the eye. Twenty abreast, the four running tugs, casting the white spume high from their bows and thrusting the billows aside in contempt, shrieking as only tugs can, snorting and coughing, sea devils that they are, out for a frolic and no work, and determined for this day to paint the harbor red. Behind them huge bulks moved stately, steamers bearing their thousands, scowls plebeian and yachts aristocratic, dredges fresh from delving, nondescripts fished from some aboriginal canal, proud warriors of the sea, ferry boats, freighters, coasting steamers and river craft, everything that could float and move was there, a world of shipping, flying every flag the ocean knows. Such a tooting and bellowing and churning as whipped the waters about the island into yeast as they took their places has never in the wildest pilot's dream been seen before, and a hundred collisions impended at once and were averted by that neat turn in the nick of time which only these tricksters of the wheel understand. For a moment more the clouds relented and showed the city's spires, the groves of Staten Island, the marvelous bridge, the grim old fort, the peerless sweep of river, the clustered heights of Brooklyn and Jersey, the stretch of water through the narrow seaward, and all the pomp and bustle of the greatest harbor in the world, then like a pall fast settling, shrouded all. 
Again nothing but the throng of shipping, nervous, shifting, expectant, and the mighty figure with the lifted torch. The time had come. From out the hedging vapors clamored a shrill voice for right-of-way, and the dispatch drove at full speed through the frightened tugs, in and out the ranks of the men of war, and came to rest. Then from the flagship the quick gleam and shock of the salute, taken up and re-echoed, gun after gun, to honor the chief of the nation. Then a lull and a silence, the fleet rocking sleepily on the swell. All eyes were fixed upon the veil which hid the mighty face. Half an hour passed. Suddenly it dropped, and the majesty of the goddess was seen. Thunder after thunder shook cloud and sea. The brazen voice of steam lifted its utmost clamors. Colors dipped. Men cheered and women applauded. The sounds from the sea were hurled back from the land. Bell spoke to bell, and cannon to cannon, till all men of the thousands gathered in her honor knew that liberty had been given and received. End of article this recording is in the public domain. Another Murder in Whitechapel From the Times of London Dated September 1st, 1888 Recorded for LibriVox.org By Leanne Howlett Another murder of the foulest kind was committed in the neighborhood of Whitechapel in the early hours of yesterday morning, but by whom and with what motive is at present a complete mystery. At a quarter to four o'clock, Police Constable Neal, 97J, when in Bucks Row, Whitechapel, came upon the body of a woman lying on a part of the footway, and on stooping to raise her up in the belief that she was drunk, he discovered that her throat was cut almost from ear to ear. She was dead but still warm. He procured assistance and at once sent to the station and for a doctor. Dr. Llewellyn of Whitechapel Road, whose surgery is not above three hundred yards from the spot where the woman lay, was aroused, and at the solicitation of a constable, dressed and went at once to the scene. He inspected the body at the place where it was found, and pronounced the woman dead. He made a hasty examination, and then discovered that, besides the gash across the throat, the woman had terrible wounds in the abdomen. The police ambulance from the Bethnal Green station having arrived, the body was removed there. A further examination showed the horrible nature of the crime, there being other fearful cuts and gashes, and one of which was sufficient to cause death apart from the wounds across the throat. After the body was removed to the mortuary of the parish and Old Montague Street White Chapel, steps were taken to secure, if possible, identification, but at first with little prospect of success. The clothing was of a common description but the skirt of one petticoat and the band of another article bore the stencil stamp of Lambeth Workhouse. The only articles in the pockets were a comb and a piece of a looking-glass. The latter led the police to conclude that the murdered woman was an inhabitant of the numerous lodging-houses of the neighborhood, and officers were dispatched to make inquiries about, as well as other officers to Lambeth to get the matron of the workhouse to view the body with a view to identification. The latter, however, could not identify, and said that the clothing might have been issued any time during the past two or three years. As the news of the murder spread, however, first one woman and then another came forward to view the body, and at length it was found that a woman answering the description of the murdered woman had lodged in a common lodging house, 18 Thrall Street, Spitalfields. Women from that place were fetched, and they identified the deceased as Polly, who had shared a room with three other women in the place on the usual terms of such houses, nightly payment of four pence each, each woman having a separate bed. It was gathered that the deceased had led the life of an unfortunate while lodging in the house, which was only for about three weeks past. Nothing more was known of her by them, but that when she presented herself for her lodging on Thursday night she was turned away by the deputy because she had not the money. She was then the worse for drink, but not drunk, and turned away laughing, saying, I'll soon get my DOS money, see what a jolly bonnet I've got now. She was wearing a bonnet, which she had not been seen with before, and left the lodging house door. A woman of the neighborhood saw her later, she told the police, even as late as 2.30 on Friday morning, in Whitechapel Road, opposite the church, and at the corner of Osborne Street, and at a quarter to four she was found within 500 yards of the spot, murdered. The people of the lodging house knew her as Polly, but at about half-past seven last evening, a woman named Marianne Monk, at present an inmate of Lambeth Workhouse, was taken to the mortuary and identified the body as that of Marianne Nichols, 
also called Polly Nichols. She knew her, she said, as they were inmates of the Lambeth workhouse together in April and May last, the deceased having been passed there from another workhouse. On the 12th of May, according to Monk, Nichols left the workhouse to take a situation as servant at Ingleside, Wandsworth Common. It afterwards became known that Nichols betrayed her trust as domestic servant by stealing three pounds from her employer and absconding. From that time she had been wandering about. Monk met her, she said, about six weeks ago when herself out of the workhouse and drank with her. She was sure the deceased was Polly Nichols, and having twice viewed the features as the body lay in the shell, maintained her opinion. So far the police have satisfied themselves, but as to getting a clue to her murderer, they express little hope. The matter is being investigated by Detective Inspector Aberline of Scotland Yard and Inspector Helson, J Division. The latter states that he walked carefully over the ground soon after eight o'clock in the morning, and beyond in the discolorations ordinarily found on pavements, there was no sign of stains. Viewing the spot where the body was found, however, it seemed difficult to believe that the woman received her death wounds there. The police have no theory with respect to the matter, except that a gang of ruffians exists in the neighborhood, which, blackmailing women of the unfortunate class, takes vengeance on those who do not find money for them. They base that surmise on the fact that within twelve months two other women have been murdered in the district by almost similar means. One as recently as the 6th of August last, and left in the gutter of the street in the early hours of the morning. If the woman was murdered on the spot where the body was found, it is impossible to believe she would not have aroused the neighborhood by her screams, Bucks Row being a street tenanted all down one side by a respectable class of people, superior to many of the surrounding streets, the other side having a blank wall bounding a warehouse. Dr. Llewellyn has called the attention of the police to the smallness of the quantity of blood on the spot where he saw the body, and yet the gashes in the abdomen laid the body right open. The weapon used would scarcely have been a sailor's jackknife, but a pointed weapon with a stout back, such as a cork cutter's or shoemaker's knife. In his opinion, it was not an exceptionally long-bladed weapon. He does not believe that the woman was seized from behind in her throat cut, but thinks that a hand was held across her mouth and the knife then used, possibly by a left-handed man, as the bruising on the face of the deceased is such as would result from the mouth being covered with the right hand. He made a second examination of the body in the mortuary, and on that based his conclusion, but will make no actual post-mortem until he receives the coroner's orders. The inquest is fixed for today. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The White Chapel Crime From the New York Times Dated July 18th 1889. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. London, July 17. The woman whose body was found in Castle Alley in the Whitechapel district last night was a middle-aged female of the disreputable class. Her throat had been cut to the spine. When the body was found it was lying on its back. The abdomen had been slashed in a horrible manner in several places. No part of the body was missing. Warm blood was flowing from the wounds when the body was discovered. A policeman, who with the watchman of an adjacent warehouse must have been within a few yards of the spot when the crime was committed, heard no noise. Policemen had been placed at fixed points in Whitechapel since the murders of this character began there, and since the one preceding that of last night, officers have been stationed at a point within a hundred yards of the scene of the last tragedy. An old clay pipe smeared with blood was found alongside the body. It is supposed by the police that this will furnish a clue to the murderer, although it may have belonged to the victim. Several arrests of suspected persons have been made, but they were discharged from custody, there being no proof on which to hold them. It is stated that a letter was received by the police officials before last night's murder in Whitechapel signed, Jack the Ripper, in which the writer said that he was about to resume his work. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Whitechapel Crimes and French Elections From the New York Times Dated July 21st, 1889 Recorded for LibriVox.org By Leanne Howlett Gossip of the Day Abroad Whitechapel Crimes and French Elections 
by the commercial cable from our own correspondent. London, July 20th. This sinister revival of the Whitechapel butcheries has not specially excited the well-to-do parts of London, where, in fact, it seems to be taken as an interesting variation upon the midsummer monotony of existence. But people who saw something of the slums in the east and south parts of the metropolis last night will never forget the unprecedented and terrible spectacle. Thousands of the lowest gutter type of street women were drunk in very bravado, all the refuse population of countless stews was swarming aimlessly from one gin shop to another, shouting, quarreling, and shrieking hideous jokes. Many hundreds of extra police, seemingly more stolid, heavy-footed, and thick-witted than ever, pushed their pompous way through the throngs, and nobody talked or thought for a moment about anything but Jack the Ripper. During the night there were two or three murderous attempts made on women with knives, but in investigation these all turned out to be ordinary regulation of phrase between drunken sailors and harpies who sought to pick their pockets, and in each case, after furious attempts by the maddened crowds to lynch them, the prisoners were released from the station houses. The afternoon papers shamelessly traded on the rumors born of one of these arrests, and placarded the streets with staring posters of the arrest and full confession of Jack the Ripper, hours after the falsity of the report had been established. It takes an event like this to show the London press and London police at their very worst, and it would be hard to say in the present instance which is the least adorable. There seems to be no more prospect now than there was a year ago that the remarkable criminal who is committing these murders will be detected, unless it be by chance. Mr. Parnell's wildly enthusiastic reception in Edinburgh yesterday and today cannot be minimized by the fact that a considerable minority of the Burgesses make a written protest against the freedom of the city being conferred on him, any more than the diminution of the Tory majority by nearly 1,000 in the East Marylebone Division of London yesterday can be explained away. The Home Rule tide has clearly not been checked by the recent sensational occurrences in the Parnell Commission. It is still rising, and it is likely to gather new strength by the fierce dissension which has risen over the question of fresh grants to the royal family. This is a subject on which it has always been easy to raise the bile of the electorate, and more than ordinary virulence has been given to the present agitation by the open bad faith of the Queen's advisers. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Another London Murder From the New York Times Dated September 11th 1889. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. London, September 10th. At 5.30 o'clock this morning, a policeman found the body of a fallen woman lying at the corner of a railway arch on Cable Street, Whitechapel. The head and legs had been cut off and carried away and the body opened. Policemen passed the spot every 15 minutes. Those on duty last night say they saw nothing suspicious. The manner in which the limbs had been severed from the body shows that the murderer was possessed of some surgical skill. The woman was about thirty years old. There was no blood on the ground where the body was found, neither was there any blood on the body. From this it is evident that the murder was committed in some other place. It is believed that the woman had been dead for two days. The body has not been identified. Three sailors, who were sleeping under the arch next to the one under which the body was found, were taken into custody by the police. They convinced the authorities, however, that they had seen or heard nothing of a suspicious nature, and they were discharged. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. World's Fair Annoyances From the New York Times Dated May 22, 1893. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. World's Fair Annoyances. Visitors made as uncomfortable as they well could be. Impossible to get anything decent to eat or drink at Jackson Park, even at outrageous prices. Extortionate charges for common necessities. The exposition officials guilty of disgraceful mismanagement. Chicago people have overreached themselves. Chicago, May 21st. Several weeks having elapsed since the opening of the fair, it is interesting to note what the impression concerning the exposition as an institution is, 
based on the sensations experienced in that short time. The consensus of opinion is that, so far as the exposition proper is concerned, it will be, in a few weeks more, thoroughly complete, comprehensive and satisfactory, and there the high opinion of it stops. No such impression of the incidents of the exhibitions in the various buildings exists. The same confidence is not reposed in the management of the grounds, the hygienic and sanitary conditions, and the general comfort of visitors. Individually, in other words, the exhibits in the main buildings will be all that could be asked, but collectively, when all the things which go to make up the grand aggregate are considered, the fair is in many respects a disappointment. This disappointment is not because of a lack of stupendous and marvelous things, but rather through the poor facilities for enjoying and studying them. A spectacle may be ever so gorgeous or unparalleled, but people want to feel comfortable properly to appreciate it. There is no great pleasure in looking at fireworks if the spectator is chilled through or ill. So also much of the pleasure to be derived from the splendid showing of the World's Fair is turned to gall and wormwood, at least for the people of ordinary means, by the manifest and palpable disadvantages and drawbacks which beset them at every step. The greatest of these is, of course, the great problem of food. How can a man be lifted up and improved by art when he studies the masters of France, England, and Holland on an empty stomach? How can he have great and beautiful ideas during the process of digesting a sandwich made of staff and doughnuts that would sink an armor-clad cruiser? There is no hope that the food at the World's Fair will ever be better or lower in price than it is now. The pretense of the management that they would stop extortion was not conceived in good faith and was practically not executed at all. The only effect was to cause one restaurant to mark down its prices five cents here and ten cents there. The prices were high enough to stand a reduction of five and ten percent and still remain outrageously high. A New York Times correspondent has tested this matter of restaurant food and prices by visiting each day a different eating place, and the result was sufficient to justify the unequivocal condemnation of the concession system which permits the most reprehensible features of a monopoly. The claim of the concessionaires that they paid a large bonus and must give the World's Fair a varying percentage of gross profits does not justify the condition of things that exists so far as the public is concerned. It merely makes the World's Fair management a party to petty robbery and shifts the responsibility where it doubtless belongs. In no eating place is it possible to get enough food to satisfy ordinary hunger for such a price as prevails in the best city restaurants for a thoroughly satisfactory meal. The German places were looked to to serve good food at moderate prices, but they are as bad if not worse than the French and the American. When two indifferent Frankfurter sausages, a tablespoonful of sauerkraut, two slices of bread, and a piece of butter cost sixty cents, the larceny is very little less than that of the French restaurateur who extorts the same price for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. In the Vienna Café on Midway Plaisance, when a man orders a bowl of soup, roast veal, and bread and butter, he pays one dollar thirty-five cents for it, and no potatoes go with the veal either. It is utterly out of the question eating the lunches served at the regular lunch counters, where the sandwiches are kept for a week and the beer and coffee are unspeakably bad. In one lunchroom, a hungry and tired woman must stand up at a counter and pay not less than fifty cents for what would cost twenty cents and be much better downtown. In a Turkish restaurant, two pint bottles of beer and two infinitesimal caviar sandwiches cost ninety cents. The story of the proprietor of this place fixes the blame where it belongs and is a sample of the tale of woe of every other concessionaire at the World's Fair. He is an Italian, long resident in Constantinople. He said, I paid to Mr. Levy, who has the concession for all things Turkish, $6,000 for permission to conduct the only Turkish restaurant and 15% of the gross profits besides. What he pays the World's Fair management I do not know, but it is a large sum. I brought from Constantinople many rich and costly pieces of tapestry to furnish the restaurant, and my expenses so far have been $3,000. I have not taken in $15, and I have been open nearly a week. To make money on an expenditure of $15,000 for a place 30 by 20 feet, I should have done a large business from May 1st. There was, however, a delay of the most trying kind in getting the cafe open, and now the people will not come. It is so everywhere. The people will not eat in the World's Fair grounds. I cannot say I blame them, but it is not our fault. It is the fault of those who tax us so outrageously. 
We must make it up by high charges or lose what we have invested. The policy of the management in the matter of food is duplicated in catalogues, steam launches, gondolas, rolling chairs, typewriters, in short, everything one is obliged or is not obliged to bring or hire. The exclusive concession to one typewriter company results in a man paying $2.25 to have ten letters written, and he can't get it done any cheaper because no competition is permitted. Such a policy, in the opinion of pretty much everybody, is short-sighted. It may be true that people can bring their lunches or get a late breakfast and leave the grounds for an early dinner, but some people cannot do either and must eat on the grounds. Neither, it may be said, does one have to hire a rolling chair or pay fifty cents to go from one station to another in a steam launch. They can walk, however tired they may be, but for the thousands whom business, not pleasure, calls to the fair, this is poor consolation. The post office in the world's fair grounds is likewise a delusion and a snare. Collections are made about four times a day, but it requires the better part of a day to get mail from the post office in the fair ground to the Chicago post office, where it must go to be sorted and distributed. It would seem that it should be sorted at Jackson Park and that time saved. There are enough inconveniences to the person who visits Jackson Park on business or pleasure to make a reverse side to the picture which portrays the beauties of the World's Fair. This reverse side becomes more emphatic when it is known that the management dines and wines almost daily on the representation that this is necessary to promote foreign and domestic interest in an exhibition which should enlist that interest by other means, it would seem, and that it makes up the expenses thus incurred by extorting money from concessionaires who in turn must get it back from the people. No wonder the bottom has dropped out of the golden expectations of so many Chicagoans who had no doubt whatever of making tremendous fortunes from the people who came from elsewhere. There has been the biggest slump imaginable in the hotel, the restaurant, and other lines, which would be pitiable to look upon, but for the greed which has been displayed. So far there have been no big fortunes made. Several small ones are being lost. The hotels are not one-third full, and half the new ones are not open yet. Of course, when warm weather comes, if it ever does, more people will come to the fair, but Chicago made preparations to entertain 500,000 strangers a day and the largest number ever seen in Chicago yet has been much less than 100,000. And somehow the better class of people cannot blame their fellow citizens of other cities for entertaining their own opinions about the fair. The fault found is in no case with exhibitors, states, or nations. It is with the management that takes from the people and gives in return only what it feels it has to give to get them to come, that extracts enormous sums from foreigners on gilded representations of tremendous immediate returns, and takes its time about giving them lights and decent roads, that is constantly in a snarl with somebody, and which to a man up a tree presents the most palpable evidence of either incompetency, willful neglect, or something worse. Time and pleasant weather may cure some of the world's fair's defects, but they will not reduce food prices, heal the sores of exhibitors whose wares are left unprotected from the ravages of the elements and thieves, nor remedy the grave mistakes that have already been made and must of necessity have effects which will be lasting in their influence on the complete success of the exposition. The white buildings can scarcely, with all their architectural charms, make amends for the unesthetic appearance of the popcorn and chair booths, nor the great exhibits themselves entirely dispel the tired feeling which there are no benches to relieve. Since President Cleveland pressed the telegraph key on the platform of the grandstand May 1st, the ruling powers appear to have been stricken with apathy, and as far as a complete exposition is concerned, it appears to be as far in the future now as it did the first day. They seem to have been paralyzed by the paucity of performances besides the plethora of promise. Their expectations had been keyed up to such a pitch that anything less than a complete fulfillment of them struck them as no fulfillment at all. And there can be no question that the reason the people have not flocked to Chicago as it was confidently expected they would is to be found in the existence of conditions that the management of the fair could have prevented if they would. It may be too late to change them now, but as they made a mistake in accepting $2,500,000 from Congress on the terms imposed, they may find that they will have to revoke a few other contracts in order to restore confidence and convince the world that existing arrangements are not all one-sided as against the people and in favor of a corporation of Chicago capitalists. The latter has all along labored under the big disadvantage of mistaking the intemperate enthusiasm of Chicago's hotel keepers and small businessmen, and the schemers of the Chamber of Commerce, Unity, and other sixteen-story buildings, 
for the sentiment of the American people. The latter differ with the Chicago boomers on the good judgment of declaring an exhibition complete a month before it is nearly finished, and bringing people from long distances at great expense to spend money in Chicago in order to be able to go away and say they did not see the exposition. Yet this small section of Chicago citizenry is getting its reward for overzealousness. The failure of banks will, in the judgment of many, be followed by collapses in other if smaller lines, and it is safe to say that Chicago has already learned enough to build her next exposition on something more substantial than wind and sand. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Memorial Notices, Mr. Oscar Wilde, from The Guardian Unlimited, dated December 1, 1900, recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Mr. Oscar Wilde died at Paris last Friday in his 45th year. He was the son of Sir William Wilde, an eminent Irish surgeon, and his mother was a woman of considerable literary ability. In 1874, he entered Magdalen College, Oxford, where he won his two firsts in the classical school and also the Newdigate Prize for English verse. But the bent of his mind was not academic or scholarly. Even while he was at Oxford, he was the most prominent leader in the new ascetic movement, as it was called. The asceticism of the day was largely a misreading of the spirit of Hellenism. The modern world is apt to draw a false antithesis between the good and the pleasant, and to make hard and fast distinctions between the moral, intellectual, and physical sides of life. The Greek knew nothing of this antithesis. Moral and physical excellence were alike beautiful. Moral and physical defects were alike ugly. Hence the philosophic basis of the new aesthetic movement, or cult of the beautiful. The beautiful in life was the only thing worth pursuing. Ugliness was a thing to be avoided. Of course there is a degree of truth in all this. But the fallacy of the ascetic doctrine of that day, as many understood it, was that it narrowed down the comprehensive Greek ideal of beauty to mere physical or material beauty. The extravagances of the ascetic school are almost forgotten now, but its warped and one-sided philosophy was not born with Wilde, nor has it died with him. He had great literary gifts. His romance, The Picture of Dorian Gray, which embodies his philosophy of asceticism, is a book of unmistakable tragic power. In 1892 he appeared as a writer of comedies with Lady Windermere's fan. This was followed by A Woman of No Importance and An Ideal Husband. His plays were witty, paradoxical, and perverse. There was little variety in the characterization, but the work in other respects was technically admirable. In 1895, Wilde disappeared from public life. Two years later, on his release from prison, he published The Ballad of Redding Gow, perhaps his most powerful piece of writing. Wilde's life is one of the saddest in English literature. His abilities were sufficient to win him an honored place as a man of letters, but they struggled in vain against his lack of character. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. How to Dress in the Water by Evelyn Sharp From the Guardian Unlimited Dated May 26, 1906 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett How to Dress in the Water by Evelyn Sharp There is a universal idea in England, shared even by the traveled, that the sea bathing of France is superior to ours. I think this only means that we find it more amusing to bathe in French than in English surrounding, for there is really not much in the French bathing arrangements that is worthy of imitation over here. In some French seaside places, Calais for instance, the arrangements are much the same as ours. One bathes from a machine, as at Margate or anywhere else, and the tide goes out so far that after a warning shout from outside of, Attention s'il vous plaît, the bather finds himself jolted and bumped over the sand till he is conveyed, with luck, to a depth of three feet of water, beyond which is only possible to wade after an argument with the presiding Neptune in yellow oilskin, who blows a tin trumpet and screams at any hardy swimmer who is out of his depth. 
At most places, though, France certainly supplies the little lath and canvas hut so highly admired by the English visitor, I suppose because it is distinctly French, and therefore suggestive of summer holidays, for I can think of no better reason. The only difference I can see between the bathing machine and the bathing hut is that the one is movable and the other fixed, and the latter is a doubtful advantage when the hut is placed high up on the beach. I have always found both equally uncomfortable, stuffy, and ill-lighted, and I have never been able to understand why neither is improved by the simple method of making the roof of ground glass and inserting a skylight in it. The solitary advantage enjoyed by French over English sea baths resolves itself into the tub of hot water supplied at the former, for which one has to pay twice over, first in the form of a ticket and secondly in that of a tip. The fact is, it is very difficult to make ideal bathing arrangements for the million. The only enjoyable way to bathe is to live on the seashore, use one's bedroom for a machine, and swim whenever inclined. I admit this does not meet the requirements of the mass of summer holiday bathers, but then... I am never really convinced that the summer holiday bathers want to bathe as much as they pretend they do. I am not referring to swimmers. They never bathe in the summer holiday sense. They go out before breakfast without talking about it and return with an appetite that commands respect for their silence. They do not discuss the state of the water and the temperature. They do not shudder with a fearful joy at the sight of breakers. They do not spend half the morning waiting for a bathing machine with a sneaking hope that they will not get one and the other half five minutes subtracted for the bathe, and dressing themselves with numbed fingers. It would be interesting to know how many people can stand shivering on the steps of a bathing machine without wishing it were all over and that they were dry and dressed again. I know the alleged reason for sea bathing is that it makes you feel so well afterwards, but so does any unpleasant experience, merely by force of contrast. It has never seemed to me an argument for going to prison, for instance. However, the summer holiday world really thinks it likes bathing, and for that reason the dress in which it bathes becomes of some consequence. In France the quality of the bathing dress is higher than in England, though I have seen as ugly visions at Boulogne as at Folkestone, and as charming ones at Folkestone as at Boulogne. Still, mixed bathing, solely becoming general over here, has always existed in France, and this has naturally made the French costume of more importance. At the same time, some of the best costumes I have seen, on either side of the water, have been worn by English women, and I think this is because the English woman, being by instinct more of a sportswoman than her French sister, would not sacrifice utility to appearances quite so much, and at the same time, having once grasped the necessity of being charmingly as well as practically clad in the water, will attain both ideals the more successfully of the two. I do not mean by this that English swimming is necessarily better than French. From what I have seen of both there is little to choose between them, and some of the best diving I ever saw was done at Dieppe, largely by the natives. But there is this difference between them. The French woman who cannot swim simply does not bother about it. She frankly bathes in a few inches of surf and spends her time conversing with her friends on the beach. The English woman, on the other hand, always keeps up the fiction that she is there to swim and, if she can do nothing better, stands with one foot on the ground and does the arm stroke, getting quite a respectable distance by a series of little hops, and deceiving no one. Therefore, the least skillful of English bathers has some regard for the practical side of her costume, just as the most skillful of French swimmers has some regard for the appearance of hers. And there is not the least reason why a bathing dress should not be practical as well as becoming. In the shops they are, as a rule, neither one nor the other, and I should strongly advise feminine bathers, if possible, to make their costumes at home. The ready-made dress is nearly always made of serge, a fairly good material for the purpose, as it does not shrink or cling or tear, but even when very fine, wet serge becomes heavy. For bathing in public, a dress has to contain so much material that its texture, since it is to be saturated with water, becomes of the first importance. For those who can afford it, I should unhesitatingly recommend taffeta silk of the strongest kind. The prettiest and most serviceable bathing dress I have seen, worn at Dieppe by an English girl, was in black taffeta, and would satisfy every requirement of the woman who wants to swim and look well at the same time. 
It was light, strong, did not sling, looked the same wet or dry, and dried quickly when exposed to the air. I cannot speak with experience of its wearing possibilities, but this one saw the season out at deep, and taffeta should wear as well as most materials if chosen carefully. We cannot all afford silk costumes, however, and Italian cloth makes a very good substitute. This wears well, I know, retains its glossy appearance when wet, and is not heavy, besides being both cheaper and lighter than serge. I must confess, though, that it is inclined to cling when drenched with water, an objection that cannot be urged against bunting, another excellent material for a bathing costume. Bunting repels rather than holds the water, and although light and loosely woven, is as strong as can be desired. In dark blue it is very successful, and the cost is small. I should always be inclined to recommend dark rather than light colors for the water, and personally have a great preference for black, though red can be effective enough if the wearer can rely upon keeping her color when bathing. There is as little variety in the shape as in the material of the ready-made bathing dress, and here again it seems as though it has been designed neither for use nor for appearance. It has a flapping sailor collar that clings round the head in the water, it has stuffy tight sleeves which impede the swimmer by cutting her arms horribly. It is made in two pieces, the bodice and skirt being combined in a shapeless tunic that more than reaches the knee, but is not long enough to hide the baggy knickerbockers that protrude below it as in early Victorian pictures of little girls. Now nothing ever devised by a dressmaker could well be more unbecoming than a garment that ends well below the knee. A figure of perfect Greek proportions could not be clothed in it and stand the test. Yet it is so easy to design and make a pretty bathing dress. To begin with, the bodice and knickerbockers should be combined into one garment, fastening on the shoulders. The short circular skirt, well gored, should be put on separately. The knickerbockers must end above the knee and the skirt reach to the knee and not an inch lower. Any disinclination to show the knee can easily be obviated by the wearing of stockings, which is very generally done abroad and adds a finish to the costume without impeding the swimmer. Sailor collars, even when stitched firmly all round, give a high-shouldered appearance which should be avoided. An ordinary turned-down shirt collar could take its place, or the dress might be finished off round the neck with a narrow feather-stitched band, or with a square opening if preferred, though this latter must fit well to keep out the water during a dive. As to the sleeves, I think nothing can better the very simple one I have always worn and found most comfortable for swimming. It consists of an undersleeve brought into a band round the arm just above the elbow, and it leaves the upper arm bare from shoulder to elbow. A second band, halfway between the two, rather improves the appearance, especially if both bands are fastened with a little bow or rosette. Needless to say, all these hints are intended only for the woman who wants to bathe in public. For the swimmer who can bathe unseen, there is nothing better than the regulation racing dress to be bought at athletic outfitters. The peignoir is another important part of the costume, especially in France, where the walk from the bathing hut to the sea is to be considered. Some people think that a kind of opera cloak without sleeves, made in bath toweling, is all that is required but I cannot help thinking that this sort of cloak, when wrapped round a dripping figure, merely suggests the indoor bath. The best shape is that of a Japanese kimono, and if the cotton material in which this is generally made is considered too limp for the purpose, the shape can easily be copied in something that repels the wet, such as bunting, or better still, the rough house flannel of which we are now making our walking skirts. Personally, I prefer a warm woolen wrap when I come out of the water, and it certainly looks better. As to the color of the peignoir, it should, if possible, harmonize with the rest of the costume, but this is not very important. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Thaw Murders Stanford White From the New York Times Dated June 26, 1906. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Thaw murders Stanford White. Shoots him on the Madison Square Garden roof about Evelyn Nesbitt. He ruined my wife, witness says he said. Audience in a panic. 
Chairs and tables are overturned in a wild scramble for the exits. Harry Kendall Thaw of Pittsburgh, husband of Florence Evelyn Nesbitt, former actress and artist model, shot and killed Stanford White, the architect, on the roof of Madison Square Garden at 11.05 o'clock last night, just as the first performance of the musical comedy Mamselle Champagne was drawing to a close. Thaw, who is a brother of the Countess of Yarmouth and a member of a well-known and wealthy family, left his seat near the stage, passed between a number of tables, and in full view of the players and of scores of persons, shot White through the head. Mr. White was the designer of the building on the roof of which he was killed. He it was who put Ms. Nesbitt, now Mrs. Thaw, on the stage. Thaw, who was in evening clothes, had evidently been waiting for Mr. White's appearance. The latter entered the garden at 10.55 and took a seat at a table five rows from the stage. He rested his chin in his right hand and seemed lost in contemplation. Thaw had a pistol concealed under his coat. His face was deathly white. According to A. L. Bellstone, who sat near, White must have seen Thaw approaching. But he made no move. Thaw placed the pistol almost against the head of the sitting man and fired three shots in quick succession body fell to the floor. White's elbow slid from the table. The table crashed over, sending a glass clinking along with a heavier sound. The body then tumbled from the chair. On the stage, one of the characters was singing a song entitled, I Could Love a Million Girls. The refrain seemed to freeze upon his lips. There was dead silence for a second, and then Thaw lifted his pistol over his head, the barrel hanging downward, as if to show the audience that he was not going to harm anyone else. With a firm stride, Thaw started for the exit, holding his pistol as if anxious to have someone take it from his hand. Then came the realization on the part of the audience that the farce had closed with a tragedy. A woman jumped to her feet and screamed. Many persons followed her example, and there was wild excitement. L. Lawrence, the manager of the show, jumped on a table and above the uproar commanded the show to go on. "'Go on playing,' he shouted. "'Bring on that chorus.' girls too terrified to sing. The musicians made a feeble effort at gathering their wits and playing the chorus music, but the girls who romped on the stage were paralyzed with horror, and it was impossible to bring the performance to an orderly close. Then the manager shouted for quiet, and he informed the audience that a serious accident had happened, and begged the people to move out of the place quietly. In the meanwhile, Thaw had reached the entrance to the elevators. On duty there was fireman Paul Bruden, he took the pistol from Thaw's hand, but did not attempt to arrest him. Policeman Deebs of the Tenderloin Station appeared and seized his arm. He deserved it, Thaw said to the policeman. I can prove it. He ruined my life and then deserted the girl. Another witness said the word was wife instead of life. A woman kissed Thaw. Just as the policeman started into the elevator with Thaw, a woman described as dark-haired and short of stature reached up to him and kissed him on the cheek. This woman, some witnesses declare, was Mrs. Thaw. The crowd was then scrambling wildly for the elevators and stairs. The employees of the garden who knew Thaw, and nearly all of them did, as he visited the place often, did not seem greatly surprised at the tragedy. When Thaw entered the garden in the early part of the show, he seemed greatly agitated. He strolled from one part of the place to another, and finally took a seat in a little niche near the stage. He was half hidden from the audience, but could see anyone who might enter. It is believed that he knew just where White would sit, and had picked out this place in order to get at him without interference. Henry Rogers of 222 Henry Street was seated at the table next to the one at which White was sitting when he was killed. He says that Thaw fired when the muzzle of his pistol was only a few inches from White's temple. Another witness said that after firing three shots and looking at White as if to be sure that he was stone dead, Thaw uttered a curse and added, You'll never go out. A Girl's Visions and Her Career From the New York Times, dated April 9, 1910 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett A Girl's Visions and Her Career Winston Churchill contributes a fascinating study of American womanhood in the making. In elder days, when the hero rode forth upon his charger, militant and adventurous, Following his high vision, the course of empire lay westward. The heroine trailed humbly behind the man on horseback, or she was trampled beneath the iron hoofs, or if she was good, 
waited demurely to be caught up on the crupper behind the victor and made a part of the triumph. They have changed all that. In our time it is the heroine who carries the pennon and rides the high steed ambition. She comes out of the west and her star is in the east where lies her vision of empire. Spurred on by vague longings for finer things, for graces, beauties, splendors, power, titles, mastered by insatiable curiosities and limitless aspirations, she climbs and tramples as she climbs upon an ascending series of dead selves. Beside each dead self, and as little unwept, she leaves a hero slain. For she rides with her clear gaze on the goal, and she rides fast. The figure would not be a fair one, however, if you did not remember that the woman on horseback is more Joan of Arc than Tamerlane. No matter if her vision is a never-never land of gracious living, which wears the outward semblance of the world of fashion in New York, London, and Paris, while her voices call her to a box at the opera, not to the saving of her country. The plain fact is that this girl out of the West, who is the typical heroine of this woman's age, grows so fast that she outgrows her hero almost as soon as she has found him, for she outgrows her old self. Her eyes look upward and outward. His are bent on ground where he grubs. The man of our time is so busy a builder of the material edifice of life that his task leaves him no leisure for growth such as hers. The edifice encloses him, limits him, as the shell does the oyster. Of such stuff heroes are not made. Modern machinery has slain the hero. The heroine has stepped into his place, because in our system of life the only person not harnessed to the chariot of accumulation is the young woman. She only is free. She is the one of all of us who has leisure to dream and by her dreams to grow. And heavens how she does grow. Jack's beanstalk is nothing to her. That is why America furnishes wives to the European aristocracy and heroines to the novelists of many nations, who sometimes give Miss America a very bad name, and why the land supplies hardly any heroes even to our own novelists. And that also is why Winston Churchill, who has hitherto clung to the tradition of the hero as the true protagonist, has so far distanced his previous performances in the present story where he frankly accepts the heroine's development as the thread upon which the drama must hang. She it is that moves and grows, and she it is that you follow absorbedly. The story is her progress, the seven stages of Honora Leffingwell. She happened to be born in Nice, where her father was consul, but for our purposes she begins in St. Louis as a very pretty little girl with a natural talent for charming for having things done for her by other people, just for the pleasure of doing it. She has the rich imagination which leads to limitless aspiration, and the invincible innocence which in a certain kind of young woman merely adds effect to the feminine arts which she uses instinctively for all her ends. You watch her grow up in her homely and provincial setting and fall under her spell as you watch. You see her transplanted to New York, mistaking the show for the substance, Choosing a hero she could only have invested with heroic glamour at just that stage. It was a schoolgirl stage, a hero she is bound to outgrow very soon. You follow her to a prosy suburb, then to a loud, gay seaside colony. You see her established upon Fifth Avenue and welcomed at Newport, and you watch her ways with men and women and her education in heroes. Of the series of these heroes, all but one command both respect and interest, exercise explicable fascination upon the growing honor in her separate stages. There is a divorce which might have been in Reno, though that Nevada city is not named. There is an episode of passionate romance with a wholesome melodramatic touch. Life also is that way. There are throughout scenes and people admirably selected and deftly presented, vital situations skillfully handled, even, what is hardest, illuminating episodes piquantly managed. Above all, there is always Honora, her young face toward the light as she sees it, remaining through all her blunders, young America incarnate, invincibly ideal. Those crudities of style which in Mr. Churchill's earlier novels used to pain the fastidious are hardly to be found here at all. Crudities of taste there are, of course, failures intact, and an omniscience of human nature which is the novelist's business, but these are not glaring. It is a far cry from Richard Carvel to A Modern Chronicle. 
and if Mr. Churchill's picture of St. Louis is truer than his picture of New York, it is because St. Louis twenty years ago was real, and New York of today is mostly sham. A Modern Chronicle by Winston Churchill Illustrated by J. H. Gardner Soper, New York, The Macmillan Company, $1.50 End of article This recording is in the public domain. One hundred forty-one men and girls die in waste factory fire, from the New York Times, dated March twenty-six, nineteen eleven, recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. One hundred forty-one men and girls die in waste factory fire, trapped high up in Washington Place building, streets strewn with bodies, piles of dead inside. The flames spread with deadly rapidity through flimsy material used in the factory. Six hundred girls are hemmed in. When elevators stop, many jump to certain death and others perish in fire-filled lofts. Students rescue some. Help them to roof of New York University building, keeping the panic-stricken in check. One man taken out alive, plunged to bottom of elevator shaft and lived there mid flames for four hours. Only one fire escape. Coroner declares building laws were not enforced, building modern, classed fireproof. Just ready to go home. Victims would have ended day's work in a few minutes. Pay envelopes identify many. Mob storms the morgue. Seeking to learn fate of relatives employed by the Triangle Waste Company. Three stories of a ten-floor building at the corner of Green Street and Washington Place were burned yesterday, and while the fire was going on, 141 young men and women, at least 125 of them mere girls, were burned to death or killed by jumping to the pavement below. The building was fireproof. It shows now hardly any signs of the disaster that overtook it. The walls are as good as ever. So are the floors. Nothing is the worse for the fire except the furniture and 141 of the 600 men and girls that were employed in its upper three stories. Most of the victims were suffocated or burned to death within the building, but some who fought their way to the windows and leaped met death as surely, but perhaps more quickly, on the pavements below. All over in half an hour. Nothing like it has been seen in New York since the burning of the General Slocum. The fire was practically all over in half an hour. It was confined to three floors, the eighth, ninth, and tenth of the building, but it was the most murderous fire that New York has seen in many years. The victims, who are now lying at the morgue, waiting for someone to identify them by a tooth or the remains of a burned shoe, were mostly girls of from sixteen to twenty-three years of age. They were employed at making shirtwaists by the Triangle Waste Company, the principal owners of which are Isaac Harris and Max Blank. Most of them could barely speak English. Many of them came from Brooklyn. Almost all were the main support of their hard-working families. There is just one fire escape in the building. That one is an interior fire escape. In Green Street, where the terrified unfortunates crowded before they began to make their mad leaps to death, the whole big front of the building is guiltless of one. Nor is there a fire escape in the back. The building was fireproof, and the owners had put their trust in that. In fact, after the flames had done their worst last night, the building hardly showed a sign. Only the stock within it and the girl employees were burned. A heap of corpses lay on the sidewalk for more than an hour. The firemen were too busy dealing with the fire to pay any attention to people whom they supposed beyond their aid. When the excitement had subsided to such an extent that some of the firemen and policemen could pay attention to this mass of the supposedly dead, they found, about halfway down in the pack, a girl who was still breathing. She died two minutes after she was found. The Triangle Waste Company was the only sufferer by the disaster. There are other concerns in the building, but it was Saturday, and the other companies had let their people go home. Messrs. Harris and Blank, however, were busy, and their girls, and some men, stayed. Leaped out of the flames. At 4.40 o'clock, nearly five hours after the employees and the rest of the building had gone home, the fire broke out. The one little fire escape in the interior was never resorted to by any of the doomed victims. Some of them escaped by running down the stairs, but in a moment or two this avenue was cut off by flame. The girls rushed to the windows and looked down at Green Street, one hundred feet below them. Then one poor little creature jumped. There was a plate-glass protection over part of the sidewalk, but she crashed through it, wrecking it and breaking her body into a thousand pieces. 
Then they all began to drop. The crowd yelled, don't jump, but it was jump or be burned, the proof of which is found in the fact that fifty burned bodies were taken from the ninth floor alone. They jumped, they crashed through broken glass, they crushed themselves to death on the sidewalk. Of those who stayed behind, it is better to say nothing, except what a veteran policeman said as he gazed at a headless and charred trunk on the Green Street sidewalk hours after the worst cases had been taken out. I saw the Slocum disaster, but it was nothing to this. Is it a man or a woman? asked the reporter. It's human, that's all you can tell, answered the policeman. It was just a mass of ashes, with blood congealed on what had probably been the neck. Messrs. Harris and Blank were in the building, but they escaped. They carried with them Mr. Blank's children and a governess, and they fled over the roofs. Their employees did not know the way, because they had been in the habit of using the two freight elevators, and one of these elevators was not in service when the fire broke out. Found alive after the fire. The first living victim, Hyman Meschel, of 332 East 15th Street, was taken from the ruins four hours after the fire was discovered. He was found paralyzed with fear and whimpering like a wounded animal in the basement, immersed in water to his neck, crouched on the top of a cable drum, and with his head just below the floor of the elevator. Meantime, the remains of the dead, it is hardly possible to call them bodies, because that word suggests something human, and there was nothing human about most of these, were being taken in a steady stream to the morgue for identification. First Avenue was lined with the usual curious East Side crowd. 26th Street was impassable. But in the morgue they received the charred remnants with no more emotion than they ever display over anything. Back in Green Street there was another crowd. At midnight it had not decreased in the least. The police were holding it back to the fire lines and discussing the tragedy in a tone which those seasoned witnesses of death seldom use. It's the worst thing I ever saw, said one old policeman. Chief Croker said it was an outrage. He spoke bitterly of the way in which the Manufacturers Association had called a meeting in Wall Street to take measures against his proposal for enforcing better methods of protection for employees in cases of fire. No chance to save victims. Four alarms were rung in fifteen minutes. The first five girls who jumped did so before the first engine could respond. That fact may not convey much of a picture to the mind of an unimaginative man, but anybody who has ever seen a fire can get from it some idea of the terrific rapidity with which the flames spread. It may convey some idea, too, to say that thirty bodies clogged the elevator shafts. These dead were all girls. They had made their rush there blindly when they discovered that there was no chance to get out by the fire escape. Then they found that the elevator was as hopeless as anything else, and they fell there in their tracks and died. The Triangle Waste Company employed about six hundred women and less than one hundred men. One of the saddest features of the thing is the fact that they had almost finished for the day. In five minutes more, if the fire had started then, probably not a life would have been lost. Last night, District Attorney Whitman started an investigation, not of this disaster alone, but of the whole condition which makes it possible for a fire trap of such a kind to exist. Mr. Whitman's intention is to find out if the present laws cover such cases, and if they do not, to frame laws that will. Girls jump to sure death. Fire nets prove useless, firemen helpless to save life. The fire, which was first discovered at 440 o'clock on the eighth floor of the ten-story building at the corner of Washington Place and Green Street, leaped through the three upper stories occupied by the Triangle Waste Company with a sudden rush that left the fire department helpless. How the fire started no one knows. On the three upper floors of the building were 600 employees of the Waste Company, 500 of whom were girls. The victims, mostly Italians, Russians, Hungarians, and Germans, were girls and men who had been employed by the firm of Harris and Blank, owners of the Triangle Waste Company, after the strike in which the Jewish girls, formerly employed, had become unionized and had demanded better working conditions. The building had experienced four recent fires and had been reported by the fire department to the building department as unsafe on account of the insufficiency of its exits. The building itself was of the modern construction and classed as fireproof. What burned so quickly and disastrously for the victims were shirtwaists, hanging on lines above tiers of workers, sewing machines placed so closely together that there was hardly aisle room for the girls between them, and shirtwaist trimmings and cuttings which littered the floors above the eighth and ninth stories. Girls had begun leaping from the eighth-story windows before the firemen arrived. The firemen had trouble bringing their apparatus into position because of the bodies which strewed the pavement and sidewalks. While more bodies crashed down among them, they worked with desperation to run their ladders into position and to spread fire nets. 
one fireman running ahead of a hose wagon which halted to avoid running over a body spread a fire net and two more seized hold of it a girl's body coming end over end struck on the side of it and there was hope for an instant that she would be the first one of the score who had already jumped to be saved thousands of people who had crushed in from broadway and washington square and were screaming with horror at what they saw watched closely the work with the fire net three other girls who had leaped for it a moment after the first one struck it on top of her and all four rolled out and lay still upon the pavement five girls who stood together at a window close to the green street corner held their places while a fire ladder was worked toward them but which stopped at its full length two stories lower down they leaped together clinging to each other with fire streaming back from their hair and dresses they struck a glass sidewalk cover and crashed through it to the basement there was no time to aid them with water pouring in upon them from a dozen hose nozzles, the bodies lay for two hours where they struck, as did the many others who leaped to their deaths. One girl, who waved a handkerchief at the crowd, leaped from a window adjoining the New York University building on the westward. Her dress caught on a wire, and the crowd watched her hang there till her dress burned free, and she came toppling down. Many jumped whom the firemen believed they could have saved. A girl who saw the glass roof of a sidewalk cover at the first story level of the New York University building leaped for it, and her body crashed through to the sidewalk. On Green Street, running along the eastern face of the building, more people leaped to the pavement than on Washington Place to the south. Fire nets proved just as useless to catch them, and the ladders to reach them. None waited for the firemen to attempt to reach them with the scaling ladders. All would soon have been out. Strewn about as the firemen worked, the bodies indicated clearly the preponderance of women workers. Here and there was a man, but almost always they were women. One wore furs and a muff and had a purse hanging from her arm. Nearly all were dressed for the street. The fire had flashed through their workroom just as they were expecting the signal to leave the building. In ten minutes more all would have been out, as many had stopped work in advance of the signal and had started to put on their wraps. What happened inside, there were few who could tell with any definiteness. All that those who escaped seemed to remember was that there was a flash of flames, leaping first among the girls in the southeast corner of the eighth floor, and then suddenly over the entire room, spreading through the linens and cottons with which the girls were working. The girls on the ninth floor caught sight of the flames through the windows, up the stairway, and up the elevator shaft. On the tenth floor they got them a moment later, but most of those on that floor escaped by rushing to the roof and then onto the roof of the New York University building, with the assistance of one hundred university students who had been dismissed from a tenth-story classroom. There were, in the building, according to the estimates of Fire Chief Croker, about six hundred girls and one hundred men. The bodies of those killed and burned to death were found principally on the ninth floor, where over fifty perished in front of a closed doorway which they had jammed shut. In the two elevator shafts, thirty or more were piled up in the bottom after the elevator had ceased running. At the bottom of a single iron fire escape in the air shaft in the building's rear, and on the fireproof stairways between the eighth and ten stories, up which the fire from the burning sewing machines on the eighth floor went with a rush of air toward the roof. When the fire was discovered, Samuel Bernstein, the waste factory's foreman, and Max Rothberg, his first assistant, were standing together on the eighth floor when the screams of girls attracted their attention to the southeast corner of the large room. They rang for the elevators, of which two were in the south side of the building, and Rothberg telephoned to the fire department and police departments. Two hundred girls were working on that floor, most of them still at their machines in the narrow aisles that gave them hardly room to move about. Dynamos, used to operate the sewing machines, were in the corner from which the fire was spreading. The two men attacked it with buckets of water, feeling confident at first they would be able to put it out. In the meantime the girls, screaming loudly and in a panic, rushed for the elevator shaft and the staircase, where they encountered a closed door. Dora Miller of 10 Cannon Street got the door part way open, but it was jammed shut again by the press of people behind her. She struck a glass panel in it with her flats until she had made the hole large enough to climb through, and she escaped. Twenty others followed her before the flames reached them, and the rest of those caught on the floor were only discernible as a mass of charred bones when the firemen at last worked their way up the staircase. Bernstein and Rothberg escaped by way of the elevator on its last trip to the floor. Factory owners escape. The two partners, Harris and Blank, were both in the building, Harris being on the ninth floor and Blank on the eighth. With Blank, according to a statement of Joseph Zito, an elevator man, were his two daughters and a governess. He was telephoning for a taxicab to take them home when the alarm was sounded. Blank told Zito, the latter declares, to keep his elevator running and take out the women first. 
The two passenger elevators, in charge of Zito and another operator named J. Gaspar, made several trips, but never went above the eighth floor, as they found more than enough people surrounding the entrance on that floor each time they reached it. One of the men, which one was not made clear in the various versions of the affair offered, deserted his elevator and ran away crying, fire, as he ran. Max Steinberg, a New York University law student, saw him running through Washington Place and at the same time saw a girl leap from an eighth-story window. He pulled a fire alarm box in Washington Square East and then ran to the building, where he entered the deserted elevator and ran it for four more trips before the heating of the cables put it out of commission. Trapped on the ninth floor. On the ninth story, which like the eighth was filled with sewing machines and was used for cutting and sewing shirtwaists, the girls fared worse than those on the floor below. They crowded about the elevator shaft, but no cars responded to their frantic ringing of the bell. Time after time they saw the cars approach, only to be filled at the eighth and go down again. Girls who rushed to the staircase were met with flames which bore them down before they could retreat. Those who reached the windows and waited there for firemen saw the ladders swing in against the building two stories below them. The one little iron fire escape, leading from a rear window, was pitiably inadequate, and it was from this floor that most of those came who fell like paper dolls end over end to the pavement. There were about twenty men on the ninth floor, calmer than the girls. They lined the southerly tier of windows first and tried to force the girls back to prevent them from jumping. Several girls were dragged back after they had reached the window sills, and some they induced to lift themselves in again after they had climbed outside and were clinging only with their hands. Zito, the elevator man, said that on his last trip down he could hear the thud of bodies striking the roof of his car as women jumped from the ninth floor after giving up hope that he would reach them. He heard the rattle of silver from their pay envelopes as it came through the iron grating into the car. The loss on this floor was not known to the firemen and police until nearly seven o'clock, when Deputy Fire Chief Benz reached it on the concrete stairway, which remained perfectly solid and unharmed. Benz found the bodies of fifty or more women, those who had not been burned beyond recognition, seeming to be mere girls. They were lying in heaps upon the floor, as if they had huddled together near the stairway and the elevator shaft, and had been overtaken there by the flames. Money from the pay envelopes were strewn about close to them. The tenth floor was the only one on which men were employed in any numbers. On this floor was the packing room, where the finished shirtwaists were prepared for shipment, and the showroom where customers were made welcome. Students saved some lives. The men and women on this floor rushed for the roof. The smoke issuing from the windows was seen by Professor F. Sumner, who was teaching twenty-five young men the principles of the New Jersey Code on the tenth floor of the law school. Professor Sumner ordered his students to rush to the roof and lower ladders to the roof of the factory building. The New York University building is one story higher than the waste factory building. One ladder was procured, and a student named Krimmer descended on it to the roof of the building on fire. Another student at the top of the ladder grasped the women as they climbed toward the top, while Krimmer kept them from blocking the bottom rungs. Men, panic-stricken, fought with the women to get to the ladder, but Krimmer shoved them away and let the women out of the danger zone first. Over one hundred women and twenty men escaped this way. Another hundred reached a building north of the burning one, whose roof was only five feet higher and could be reached without a ladder. How many reached the streets through the stairways nobody knew, as they were foreigners who spoke little English and fled for their homes in the Lower East Side as soon as they gained the sidewalk. The task of the police and firemen outside the building was hardly started before the fire had caused its full damage and loss of life. The three burned stories, after it was all over and fire department searchlights played upon them, were seen to be wholly intact, except for their wooden window trim and wooden floor coverings. Red tiling flashed the searchlight glow back to the street below from all the ceilings, and steel and concrete layers made the floors as firm to the tread of the firemen as if they had been newly built. Police and firemen arrive. The call to the police reached headquarters over the telephone in a brief message that said girls were jumping from the Triangle Waste Company windows. The police were familiar with the place, as it had played a center role in the opening phases of the shirtwaist strike. Headquarters, from First Deputy Commissioner Driscoll and Chief Inspector Schmidtberger to the last clerk and doorman, emptied itself at Driscoll's orders into the fire zone. Inspector Daly and twelve captains reported to Schmidtberger a few moments after he arrived. Captain Dominic Henry of the Mercer Street Station had preceded Driscoll and Schmidtberger and was attempting to establish fire lines when they arrived. Twenty-five patrol wagons from all the downtown precincts and one hundred fifty men came into the fire zone. They made one line on Washington Square East, forcing the people to the west side of the street, another line at Broadway, and cross street lines at Waverly Place and on 4th Street. The second, third, and fourth fire alarms were turned in before any apparatus had appeared. 
on the receipt of information at fire headquarters that there were twenty or more dead on the sidewalks. Chief Croker arrived in time to see his men spreading hopelessly their small and one or two large life nets and saw many jump to their deaths. Ambulances from Bellevue in New York and St. Vincent's Hospital, twenty or more in number, lined the street, in Washington Square East and in Washington Place. Ten surgeons from Bellevue, under doctors Byrne, Reed, and Kemp, threaded their way among the firemen, gathering up the dead. They worked at this task from six o'clock until seven, and then policemen came to their assistance. The bodies found on Green Street were taken to the east sidewalk, while those in Washington Place were laid in lines on both sidewalks. Tarpaulins, laid over them, protected them somewhat from the deluge of water which, pouring from the high-pressure towers like a miniature Niagara, flowed down the side of the building and into foot-deep flood along the pavement. The surgeons could offer little aid except to cover over the bodies of the dead. Here and there from nearby stores reports came of injured, and a few ambulances drove away with these to the hospitals. Mostly all there was to do was to determine that life was extinct in the bodies on the pavement and cover them over. Deputy Police Commissioner Driscoll sent in an order at 6.30 o'clock for 75 coffins, and later another order for 75 more. It was not known to the firemen and policemen at first that the death roll would reach anything like its final proportions. How many died? A thirteen-year-old girl hung for three minutes by her fingertips to the sill of a tenth-floor window. A tongue of flame licked at her fingers, and she dropped to death. A girl threw her pocketbook, then her hat, then her furs, from a tenth-floor window. A moment later her body came whirling after them to death. At a ninth-floor window a man and a woman appeared. The man embraced the woman and kissed her. Then he hurled her to the street and jumped. Both were killed. Five girls smashed a pane of glass, dropped in a struggling tangle, and were crushed into a shapeless mass. A girl on the eighth floor leaped for a fireman's ladder, which reached only to the sixth floor. She missed, struck the edge of a life net, and was picked up with her back broken. From one window, a girl of about thirteen years, a man, a woman, and two women with their arms about one another, threw themselves to the ground in rapid succession. The little girl was whirled to the New York hospital in an ambulance. She screamed as the driver and a policeman lifted her into the hallway. A surgeon came out, took one look at her face, and touched his hand to her wrist. She is dead, he said. One girl jumped into a horse blanket held by firemen and policemen. The blanket ripped like cheesecloth and her body was mangled almost beyond recognition. Another dropped into a tarpaulin held by three men. Her weight tore it from their grasp and she struck the street, breaking almost every bone in her body. Almost at the same moment, a man somersaulted down upon the shoulder of a policeman holding the tarpaulin. He glanced off, struck the sidewalk, and was picked up dead. Chief Croker thought at first it would not go over twenty-five. Then he placed the number at sixty-five, the total on the streets, and reported from the inside. At seven o'clock, over two hours after the firemen had come, the dead on the ninth floor were found, and those in the elevator shaft, each find sending the total up beyond the largest estimates previously made. In getting out the bodies, the task proved so formidable that it was late in the night before it was reasonably complete. Taking the bodies away. Coroner's physician O'Hanlon, with coroners Holtzheiser and Lahane, arrived at 6.45 o'clock along with District Attorney Whitman and several of his assistants. O'Hanlon explained that he had cared for the dead from the Slocum disaster on the recreation pier, and it would be better to handle these in the same manner, as the morgue would prove hopeless to the task of accommodating them. He said he had still some of the tags such as were used in the Slocum disaster, and he proposed that each body be tagged exactly where it lay and that records be made by number. He was told by Coroner Holtzhauser to proceed in this manner, and did so with the assistance of one hundred or more policemen. As fast as bodies had been looked over for identifications and tags fastened to them, coffins were brought from a supply depot established in East Washington Place. In these rude wooden boxes, coverless, the bodies were placed in patrol wagons and driven away. At 7.45 o'clock, the searchlights from four fire department engines were playing in the upper windows, and a glow came out of them from torches carried within by firemen. Suddenly a black shadow swung out of the ninth-story window, and the creaking of pulleys and a rope and tackle began, as the black mass descended speedily toward the ground. Firemen and windows on the lower floor guided the ropes. It was the beginning of the work of bringing out the bodies from the floor where the death roll was the largest. The pulley system worked for an hour, each body being lowered after it had been wrapped in black cloth and tied securely, until it resembled just such packages as go up and down daily in the business district, rope and pulley fashion. Coroner's Statement The scene was more than Coroner Holtzhauser could stand. Sobbing like a child, the coroner, who was first to open the fireplace where Ruth Wheeler's body was incinerated in the Walter Flat, 
said that that scene was easy to stand compared with this. And only one miserable little fire escape, he said. I shall proceed against the building department along with the others. They are as guilty as any. They haven't been insistent enough, and these poor girls who were carried up in the elevator to work in the morning, now they come down on the end of a rope. That investigations from many centers would be started was early made apparent. Building department officials who arrived at 7.20 o'clock said they would begin one this morning. Fire Marshal Beers said he would begin another. The district attorney made a list of witnesses that he will question. Chief Croker's View Fire Chief Croker, after the fire had flickered down to a few embers still glowing here and there, spoke vigorously against the men who have opposed his plans for better fire protection. Look around everywhere, he said. Nowhere will you find fire escapes. They say they don't look sightly. I have tried to force their installation, and only last Friday a manufacturer's association met in Wall Street to oppose my plan and to oppose the sprinkler system as well as the additional escapes. This is just the calamity I have been predicting, said Chief Croker. There were no outside escapes on this building. I have been advocating and agitating that more fire escapes be put on factory buildings similar to this. The large loss of life is due to this neglect. He said that there was only one fire escape from the building, an old-time perpendicular affair, he said, leading to the courtyard in the center of the block of buildings, which would only allow of one person's escape at a time. When he examined this escape, he said, he found on the upper rooms that it had become very loose, and it was a dangerous matter to escape by that route. A repetition of this disaster is likely to happen at any time in similar buildings, he said. He advocated balcony fire escapes with a wide iron staircase. The staircases in the building, the chief said, were of the ordinary three feet six inches wide type, but he believed that if escape had been sought by that route, the death list would not have been so appalling. There were rumors that the fire started by a gasoline explosion, but the survivors said that they had heard no explosion. Fire Commissioner R. Waldo being out of town yesterday, the fire was in charge of Deputy Commissioner Arthur J. O'Keefe, in charge of Brooklyn and Queens, who was taking the Commissioner's place. He and Coroner Holthauser had a dispute concerning the cause of the fire at 11.20 o'clock. Holthauser remarked that there was terrible responsibility for the fire department to meet. And for some other departments, too, O'Keefe replied. Commissioner Waldo, to my certain knowledge, had reported this place to the building department within the past three months as a building unsafe for use as a factory, since there were insufficient means of egress by stairways, and there were not sufficient fire escape facilities. Oh, that makes a difference, then, Holtzhauser concluded. Winfield R. Sheehan, Commissioner Waldo's secretary, joined the group at that juncture. He said that he personally had mulled the protest to the building department and knew of Commissioner Waldo's anxiety because of the unsafe condition of the building and his inability to force the making of changes. Alfred Ludwig of the Department of Buildings was acting in the capacity of superintendent during the absence of Superintendent Rudolph P. Miller, who was out of town last night. The building which was burned, it was said by one of the members of the department, who stands near to the commissioner but who refused to be quoted, was one of several thousand which had been recommended by the fire department for additional fire escapes. These recommendations, said the official, were made several weeks ago after a thorough investigation by members of the fire department of all office, manufacturing, and loft buildings in the five boroughs. These investigations were made by the fire department at the request of Commissioner Waldo, although according to law this department had no control over the construction and means of escape on the many large factory buildings in the city. There was not one building in the city which escaped the eyes of the fire department, each place being investigated by the foreman of the engine company in the district in which it was situated. The investigation lasted weeks, and after a report had been made to the commissioner, it was forwarded to the building or the tenement house department. Many of the recommendations which were made by the commissioner were at once attended to, but this one seems to have been neglected. Fire chiefs and others connected with the department seemed to believe that the large loss of life could have been avoided had the operators not become panic-stricken. The work of the elevator men was spoken of by members of the department with praise, who seemed to think had they not kept their heads the total loss of life might have been doubled. The building, Chief Croker said, was all that could be wished for in the way of fireproof construction. But it isn't the building that's going to give us fireproof conditions, Croker said to the dripping firemen and others crowded around him. The lesson of the fire is that a building is just as fireproof as the stuff within it. Fireproof walls, fireproof floors, and fireproof stairways then rooms packed with flimsy cloth and trimmings and run by electric dynamos about which waste and oil were allowed to accumulate. The Edison Company strung lights between 8 and 9 o'clock through every floor in the building to aid the firemen in their search for bodies. The cloud of smoke from the fire was visible in all parts of Manhattan. 
It rose straight in the air above the roof, and then for a time between five and six o'clock tongues of flame illumined the darker mass above. The firemen could not reach it with their hose streams, and even the high-pressure towers had difficulty in throwing their streams above the ninth floor. No water went over the roof until firemen made their way up the staircase after the firefighting had become a matter of detail in small burning sections. It leaped across an open areaway into the New York University Law School, destroying the faculty room and damaging two classrooms. Students carried many valuable books to safety out of the library and helped with buckets to wet down woodwork that was beginning to smoke in the intense heat. Nowhere in the building except on the three upper floors were people at work. The other concerns in the building had dismissed their forces at three o'clock, and only the shirtwaist makers were continuing at work. These were Meyer, Crows and Wallace, clothiers on the sixth and seventh floors, Morris Blum, clothier on the fifth and sixth floors, Harris Brothers, clothiers on the third and fourth floors, and the Hatters Exchange and Martin Bates, Jr. on the first and second floors. The superintendent of the building, who refused to give his name or identify himself other than that he was employed by J.J. J. Ash of 735 Broadway, the owner, said there were two freight elevators in the rear on which the owners had partly depended to get the shirtwaist makers out in case of fire. Whether anyone had tried to use them, or if anyone had come down on them, he did not know. The building was roped off at 10.30 o'clock, and the police lines withdrawn, except for the streets immediately surrounding it. Relatives of the dead were not allowed to come near while the work of the firemen and surgeons was going on, but were taken under police escort to the Mercer Street Station, where a vast crowd congregated throughout the evening. Broadway, at eleven o'clock, in the vicinity of Washington Place, was thronged with women, walking up and down and wringing their hands while calling the names of their kinfolks whom they had lost. Scenes at the morgue. Men and women gather in a frantic throng in quest of loved ones. A few minutes after the first load of fire victims was received at the Bellevue Hospital morgue, the streets were filled with a clamoring throng, which struggled with the reserves stationed about the building in an effort to gain entrance to view the bodies of the dead in the hope of identifying loved ones. The frantic mob was reinforced as a hospital wagon brought more of the dead to the institution. The sobbing and shrieking mothers and wives, and frantic fathers and husbands of those who had not been accounted for, struggled with the police and tried to stop the wagon that was bearing the dead on its trips to the morgue. Mothers and wives ran frantically through the street in front of the hospital, pulling their hair from their heads and calling the names of their dear ones. A few of the surging mob who viewed the situation in a calmer manner attempted to calm the excited ones, but in vain. The police were abused because they would not allow the surging mob in the morgue, and in many instances they were threatened, and had to resort to the use of their nightsticks to keep the struggling mass from breaking in. Two members of the throng who succeeded in gaining entrance to the morgue were Mrs. Josephine Pannell of 49 Stanton Street and her son-in-law, who came in search of her daughter, Mrs. Jane Piccolo, 18 years old. She was last seen struggling to get into the elevator on the eighth floor of the building. Mrs. Pannell walked up and down the aisle that was formed between the rows of the unidentified dead and looked in vain for her daughter. She was filled with hope, however, when an attendant announced that the wagon had just arrived with another load of the fire victims. The newly arriving dead were brought into the morgue and stretched out, and Mrs. Pannell and her son-in-law ran frantically up and down the lines trying to find the one they sought. When the mother found that her search was in vain, she ran shrieking to her son-in-law and began tearing out her hair. Bucalo stood as a man in a trance, gazing at the rows of blackened bodies. Suddenly he reeled and fell to the floor. He was assisted to his feet by the attendants. Presently Mrs. Pannell became calmer, and seeing that there was no body among the dead that would answer the description of her daughter, she grew more composed, and thought it was probable that her daughter had escaped from the burning building alive. At the door of the morgue, Mrs. Pannell met a reporter, and told him of her miraculous escape from the burning building, and the cause of her frantic search for the body of her daughter. According to her story, she was in the reading room of the factory when the fire was discovered. She, with others, ran to the elevator shaft, and when the car reached the eighth floor, they fought to get into it. She said that she seized her daughter by the skirt before leaving the cutting room, and as she was being carried into the elevator by the frantic mob that was surging behind her, her hold on her daughter's dress was torn away, and she remembers seeing the terrorized face of her daughter as the car was starting downward. She called to her daughter and thought that she saw her reel and fall to the floor as the car shot downward. Mrs. Pannell described graphically the surging throng that clamored in the hall of the eighth floor and the struggle of the employees to gain entrance to the elevator car. She told of the rush of the occupants of the car when the elevator reached the ground floor on its last trip. She said she had a dim recollection of persons being trampled underfoot by the excited mob as they dashed from the car to the entrance of the building, and that she believed many who were trampled upon perished in the bottom of the elevator car. She also said that when the car left the eighth floor, 
Some of the employees made a vain attempt to leap on the top of the car, and that a few, being pushed forward by the struggling mass behind them, fell down the shaft through the open doorway of the shaft on the eighth floor, and were dashed to death upon the roof of the car. Police worked desperately. A hundred policemen, most of them ashen and with trembling lips, worked at the heart-rending task of keeping back, without undue roughness, the maddened thousands. For God's sake, one cried to a reporter who was wedging his way out of the mob, get me a drink. The poor blue coat needed it. Every few minutes a patrol wagon or a hastily improvised morgue wagon that had done duty as an auto truck earlier in the day appeared at the head of the mob at First Avenue and 26th Street, and the reserves of six precincts had to force open a narrow path through the crowd for it. As soon as the path was opened in front, however, the crowd surged in behind it. At the sight of the bodies, the crowd broke into fresh weeping and screaming, each seeming to see, in the charred and often unrecognizable remains, a loved one. Twelve patrol wagons from as many stations, besides dozens of hastily impressed dispensary wagons of the police department and the Department of Public Charities, and a few auto trucks were used in transporting the dead from the fire to the morgue. The morgue itself became too crowded early in the evening for further storage of bodies, and the Charities Department decided to throw open the long public dock adjoining it. Here, as night settled over the city, the bodies were taken from the wagons and laid out side by side in double rows along either side of the long docks. Besides the thirty attendants regularly at the pier, twenty derelicts who had applied at the municipal lodging house in East 26th Street for a night's rest were pressed into service for the ghastly work. In the narrow lane, left between the double rows of the dead on the dark pier, the patrol wagons and rude dead wagons crept slowly to where the lines had freshly ended. They deposited their freight, backed slowly out, and returned to the scene of the fire for more bodies. As fast as the dead were brought to the pier, the grimy panhandlers, and derelicts were set to work arranging them in rows, and later putting them in the rough wooden boxes that serve as coffins nightly at the morgue. But the supply of boxes was soon exhausted, and Commissioner Drummond of the Department of Charities was obliged to send over to the storage warehouse on Blackwell's Island for more. Presently there steamed up to the pier from the island a large double-decked launch, bringing stacked up on its deck one hundred more boxes. Them boxes wasn't brought here since the Slocum fire, said one old attendant at the morgue, amid a tense silence. Other attendants nodded reminiscently. Considerable confusion was caused on the pier in numbering the dead. The police of the various precincts had received from the Charities Department small colored tags bearing numbers to tag the different boxes as soon as the bodies were laid in them. There turned out to be three separate systems of numbers, and the enumeration had to be done all over again. At 11.30 o'clock, with the mob still storming more and more outside, the police had counted in the morgue and on the pier 136 bodies, 13 men, and 123 women. Fifty-six of these were burned beyond all but human semblance and may never be identified. The thousands of clamorers outside could not have identified them, even if the police had let them swarm in on the pier. As the maddened throng swarmed around the ghastly-laden patrol wagons and improvised hearses, their misery wrung even the hardened habitual handlers of the dead in the morgue, making them frequently turn away from their work. There were hundreds scantily clad and shivering, despite their raving in the cold night air, Many of them had no money. Their week's funds were in the pay envelopes, found in dozens on the scorched and irrecognizable bodies on the pier. One woman, her head charred to a mere twisted blur of black, carried in her stocking six hundred dollars in tightly crumpled bills. Dozens of the girls whose bodies were laid out on the pier were found to have carried their scant savings in this way. Clung together in death. Two girls, charred beyond all hope of identification, and found in the smoking ruins with their arms clasped around each other's necks, were conveyed to the pier, still together, and placed in one box. Horrible cries had burst from the misery-stricken mob outside when these two were carried through the narrow lane in the street, and a few of the clamorous throng had forced their way to the wagon and lifted the dark tarpaulin. Everywhere burst anguished cries for sister, mother, and wife, a dozen pet names in Italian and Yiddish, rising in shrill agony above the deeper moan of the throng. Now and then a reporter, the way cleared before him by a broad, white-faced policeman, forced his way to the nearest telephone to send to his office a report of what was happening there. Each time a hundred faces were turned up to him imploringly, and a hundred anguished voices begged of him tidings of those within. Had he seen a little girl with black hair and dark brown cheeks? Had he seen a tall, thin man with stooped shoulders? Could he describe any one of the many he had seen in there? The poor wretches were hunting for a story, too. Piteously they pleaded with the policemen to let them, only them, pass, so that they might see whether their loved ones were on the pier. They would only look around, one short glance, and come straight out. 
the policemen, struggling with their own emotions more roughly than with the crowd, could only put them off. Presently, they said, in a very little while now, they would let them all in. When finally the pleadings and struggles of the anguish-racked multitude bade fair to drive them through all lines in a hungry swarm over the pier and into the morgue, Inspector Walsh, Captain Cray of the East 35th Street Station, Commissioner Drummond, his deputy Frank J. Goodwin, and coroner's physicians Weston and O'Hanlon held a hurried consultation behind the barred doors of the morgue. They decided to number each body anew to make sure of the count, to turn over the valuables or money found with the bodies to Lieutenant Sullivan for safe keeping, and then to let the throng in small parties into the place. As soon as the body was identified, they would place the lid on the coffin and remove it to one side. The mere announcement, spreading through the crowd outside, that the police would let them through and open the doors at midnight, threw the mob into a wild hysteria of almost joy. Several women had to be taken to Bellevue for treatment, laughing and crying and struggling all the way. Inside, as they heard the savage cries of the mob, they sickened and paled at the thought of what would follow when the doors were opened. Fifty-six, muttered Inspector Walsh, turning his face away. They call him Smiling Dick Walsh, but his averted face was not smiling. He meant the fifty-six bodies that were burnt or crushed beyond recognition, fifty-six that would certainly be buried in unnamed graves. Dozens of them had every stitch of clothing burned off them. One body, that of a young girl, was headless and burned to a crisp. Commissioner Drummond realized that when the mad throng was led into the morgue and on the pier, many of them, already crazed by uncertainty concerning their loved ones, might at the sight of the dead throw themselves into the river. He therefore ordered that every opening in the morgue building and on the covered pier be boarded up at once, and that no space should be left which would permit the passage of a body. At midnight, by order of Captain Gray, the door of the morgue was opened for a brief moment, and the foremost of the surging mob outside, to the number of fifteen, was allowed to enter. The police squad at the doors could hardly keep the rest back, with promises of letting them, too, presently enter in groups of fifteen. Each group, shivering and clamoring and weeping, was lined up at the door and allowed slowly to file between the rows of boxes. Two policemen accompanied each of them, ready to support them if they should faint, and more than half of them did. They looked around with an air of frightened bewilderment at the ghastly array of dead, and then, one by one, looking down at the nearest box at their feet, where the mangled bodies lay, with heads propped up on boards for the light of the attendant beside the box, they collapsed with cries of terror. Such were carried to one side and revived by physicians from Bellevue, and later warmed with coffee handed to them by attendants and panhandlers at the pier. Scores of men and women thought they saw in the ghastly bodies propped up in the boxes the relatives they were looking for, but could not identify them positively. Around several bodies gathered men and women in small knots, each insisting pitifully that what was propped up there belonged to them, and calling the unrecognizable mass with tender pet names. One man, William Mantis of 35 Second Avenue, came there seeking for his sister Sarah, aged 15, his sister Lucy, 19 years, and his mother, all of whom had worked in the same shop. He couldn't find any of them and broke down completely. Another, Dominic Leone of 444 East 13th Street, came to find three cousins and a niece who hadn't returned home. He did not find them. At 1 a.m., eight bodies had been identified by relatives and set aside in sealed boxes. The relatives filed into the improvised coroner's office in the morgue and tearfully stood in line for their slips, permitting them to have the bodies removed. There was a competitive mob of undertakers with their wagons at the outskirts of the crowd, ready to do that. End of article. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Typhoid Mary asked $50,000 from City. From the New York Times, dated December 3, 1911. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Typhoid Mary asked $50,000 from City. Not a germ carrier and never had a contagious disease, she says. Her lawyer to file suit. Her standing as a cook has been injured by her three years' imprisonment as a public danger. Typhoid Mary, the cook who came by that nickname because of the cases of typhoid fever that seem to follow her around from family to family, is about to sue the city and its health department for $50,000 damages for keeping her in confinement on North Brother Island for three years. Papers will be served within the next few days on Dr. Letterly, 
head of the health department, and four physicians, Dr. Darlington, Dr. Soper, Dr. Park, and Dr. Westmoreland. Mary Mallon is the name on the complaint. She is 40 years old and says she has never had typhoid fever or any other dangerous disease. She was released from the hospital last February, and since that time she has been unable to follow her trade of cooking, and her chances of making a living have been greatly reduced, she asserts. She will attempt to show that she was not the typhoid germ carrier the city authorities have made her out. The lawyer who will prosecute Mary's case against the city is the same one who appeared for her before the Supreme Court in 1909 when her freedom was denied. He is George Francis O'Neill of 5 Beekman Street, and he is a specialist in medico-legal questions. If the Board of Health, he said yesterday, is going to send every cook to jail who happens to come under their designation of germ carrier, it won't be long before we have no cooks left and the domestic problem will be further complicated. What would the poor jokesmith do then for his stories about the cook who rules the house? The story of Typhoid Mary has been made the subject of a pamphlet by Dr. George A. Soper, who is mentioned in the complaint. The case goes back to 1906, when an alarming spread of typhoid fever was experienced at Oyster Bay. Six out of a family of eleven had been stricken with typhoid. The water of the well was naturally first suspected, and it was made the subject of a careful analysis. Nothing was wrong with the water. Dr. Soper examined the food supply of the family, but here again he found nothing out of the way. He began to look for some peculiar situation, and focused his suspicions on the fact that the family had changed cooks about three weeks before the fever began. Dr. Soper then began to investigate the record of Mary Mallon. He found that in 1904 she had been employed at the home of Henry Gilsey at Sands Point, Long Island. The family had eleven persons in it, of whom seven were servants. Within a month, four of the servants were taken with typhoid. In 1902, Mary was the cook for J. Coleman Drayton at Dark Harbor, Maine. Seven persons out of nine were taken ill within a short time. Three other instances are set forth where the fever followed within a short period after the employment of the cook. In all, he laid at her door 26 cases of typhoid, and he added that he had traced but fragments of her history during ten years. The physicians of the health department have never been able to discover that Mary herself ever had typhoid. She is described as a robust woman and weighing about 190 pounds. The doctor suggested that she undergo an operation. To this she would not submit. In fact, she always insisted that she never gave typhoid to anybody, but that the water was at fault. The case was adjudged one for confinement in March 1907, and Mary, after a contest of physical strength with five policemen, was taken to North Brother Island. In 1909 she was before the Supreme Court on a writ of habeas corpus. Judge Geigerich sent her back to the hospital expressing sympathy for the woman, but insisting that she was a menace to the community. At the time of her release, Dr. Letterly made a statement to the effect that Mary had been shut up long enough to learn precautions. She promised the department that she would not again take a place as a cook. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The novel is doomed, Will Harbin thinks. From the New York Times, dated October 3, 1915, by Joyce Kilmer. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. The novel is doomed, Will Harbin thinks. Noted Georgia author says that automobile, moving picture, and aeroplane are gradually weaning people away from reading fiction. The novel is doomed. If the automobile, the aeroplane, and the moving picture continue to develop during the next ten years as they have developed during the last ten, people will cease almost entirely to take interest in fiction. It was not Henry Ford who told me this. Neither was it Mr. Wright nor Monsieur Pate. The man who made this ominous prophecy about the novel is himself a successful novelist. He is Will N. Harbin, author of Paul Baker, Anne Boyd, The Desired Woman, and many other widely read tales of life in rural Georgia. Although he is so closely associated with the southern scenes about which he has written, Mr. Harbin spends most of his time in New York nowadays. He justifies this course interestingly, but before I tell his views on this subject, I will repeat what he had to say about this possible extinction of the novel. 
You have read, he said, of the tremendous vogue of Pickwick Papers when it was first published. No work of fiction since that time has been received with such enthusiasm. In London at that time, you would find statuettes of Pickwick, Mr. Winkle, and Sam Weller in the shop windows. There were Pickwick punch ladles, Pickwick teaspoons, Pickwick souvenirs of all sorts. Now, when you walk down Broadway, do you find any reminders of the popular novels of the day? You do not, except, of course, in the bookshops. But you do find things that remind you of contemporary taste. In the windows of the stationers and druggists you find statuettes not of characters in the fiction of the day, but of Charlie Chaplin. Of course the moving pictures has not supplanted the novel, but people all over the country are becoming less and less interested in fiction. The time which many people formerly gave to the latest novel they now give to the latest film. And the moving picture is by no means the only thing which is weaning us away from the novel. The automobile is a powerful influence in this direction. Take, for instance, the town from which I come, Dalton, Georgia. There the people who used to read novels spend the time which they used to give to that entertainment riding around in automobiles. Sometimes they go on long trips, sometimes they go to visit their friends in nearby towns. But automobiling is the way in which they nowadays are accustomed to spend their leisure. Naturally, this has its effect on their attitude toward novels. Years ago, when Dalton had a population of about 3,000, it had two well-patronized bookshops. Now it has a population of about 7,000 and no bookshops at all. I suppose one of the reasons is that people live their adventures by means of the automobile and therefore do not care so much about getting adventures from the printed page. But the chief reason is one of time. The fact is that people more and more prefer automobiling to reading. Now if the aeroplane were to be perfected, as we have every reason to believe it will be, so that we could travel in it as we now do in the automobile, what possible interest would we have in reading dry novels? It seems likely that in a hundred years we will be able to see clearly the surface of Mars. Do you think that people will want to read novels when this wonderful new world is before their eyes? The authors themselves are beginning to realize this. They are becoming more and more nervous. They are not the placid creatures that they were in Sir Walter Scott's day. They feel that people are not as interested in them and their works as they used to be. I doubt very much if any publisher today would be interested, for example, in an author who produced a novel as long as David Copperfield and of the same excellence. But do you think, I asked, that the fault is entirely that of the public? Haven't the authors changed, too? I think that the authors have changed, said Mr. Harbin reflectively. The authors do not live as they used to live. The authors no longer live with the people about whom they write. Instead, they live with other authors. Nowadays, an author achieves success by writing, we will say, about the people of his home in the far west. Then he comes to New York. And instead of living with the sort of people about whom he writes, he lives with artists. That must have its effect upon his work. But is not that what you yourself did, I asked? A New York apartment house is certainly the last place in the world in which to look for the historian of Pole Baker. Mr. Harbin smiled. But I don't live with artists, he said. I try to live with the kind of people I write about. I resolved a long time ago to try to avoid living with literary people and to live with all sorts of human beings, with people who didn't know or care whether or not I was a writer. So I have for my friends and acquaintances, sailors, merchants, people of all sorts of professions and trade, and people of that sort, people who make no pretensions to be artists, are the best company for a writer, for they open their hearts to him. A writer can learn how to write about humanity by living with humanity, instead of with other people who are trying to write about humanity. But at any rate, you have left the part of the country about which you write, I said, and wasn't that one of the things for which you condemned our hypothetical writer of Western tales? Not necessarily, said Mr. Harbin. It sometimes happens that an author can write about the scenes he knows best only after he has gone away from them. I know that this is true of myself. It's in line with the old saws about distance lends enchantment and emotion remembered in tranquility, you know. I believe that Du Maurier was able to write his vivid descriptions of life in the Latin Quarter of Paris because he went to London to do it. You see, I absorbed life in Georgia for many years, and in New York I can remember it and get a perspective on it and write about it. Then I said, you would go to Georgia, I suppose, if you wanted to write a story about life in a New York apartment. Mr. Harbin thought for a moment. No, he said slowly, I don't think that I'd go to Georgia to write about New York. I think that a novel about New York must be written in New York, while a novel about Dalton, Georgia, must be written away from Dalton, Georgia. How do you account for that? I asked. 
Well, said Mr. Harbin, for one thing there is something bracing about New York's atmosphere that makes it easier to write when one is here. Once I tried to write a novel in Dalton and I simply couldn't do it. And the reason why a novel about New York must be written in New York is because you can't absorb New York as you might absorb Georgia, so to speak, and then go away and express it. New York is so thoroughly artificial that there is nothing about it which a writer can absorb. New York hasn't the puzzles and adventures and surprises that Georgia has. Everybody knows about apartment houses and skyscrapers and subways and elevators and dumbwaiters. There's nothing new to say about them. I sometimes think that the reason why the modern novel about New York City is so uninteresting is because everybody tries to write about New York City. And their novels are all of one pattern, necessarily, because life in New York City is all of one pattern. In bygone days this was not true of New York. For instance, Mr. Howell's novels about New York City were about a community in which people lived in real houses and had families and friends. In those days, life in New York had its problems and surprises and adventures. It was not lived mechanically and according to a set pattern. What I have said about the advisability of an author's leaving the scenes about which he is to write is not universally true. There are writers who do better work by staying in the place where the scenes of their stories are laid. For instance, Joel Chandler Harris did better work by staying in the South than he would have done if he had gone away. But wasn't that because his Negro folk tales were a sort of glorified reporting rather than creative work, I asked? No, said Mr. Harbin, they were creative work. Joel Chandler Harris remembered just the bare skeleton of the stories as the Negro had told them to him, and he developed them imaginatively. That was creative work and he did most of his writing, and the best of his writing, in the office of the Constitution. In view of what you said about the difficulty of absorbing New York life, I suggested, I suppose that in your opinion the great American novel will not be written about New York. What do you mean by the great American novel, asked Mr. Harbin? So far as I know, there is no great English novel or great Russian novel. I suppose that the term means a novel inevitably associated with the national literature, I said, you cannot think of English literature without thinking of Vanity Fair, for instance. Certainly there is no American novel so conspicuously a reflection of our national life as that novel is of English life. Well, said Mr. Harbin, it is difficult to think of American literature or of American life without thinking of the novels of William Dean Howells. But the great American novel, to use that term, would be less likely to come into being than the great English novel. You see, the United States is not as compact as England. London, it may be said, is England. It has all the characteristics of England, and in the season all England may be met there. Mr. Harbin is not in sympathy with the theories of some of our modern realists. The trouble with the average realist, he said, is that he doesn't believe that the emotions are real. As a matter of fact, the greatest source of material for the novelist is to be found in the emotional and spiritual side of human nature. If writers were more receptive to spiritual and emotional impressions, they would make better novels. It is the soul of man that the greatest novels are written about. There is Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, for example. In spite of his criticisms of some of the methods of the modern realists, Mr. Harbin believes strongly in the importance of one realistic dogma, that which has to do with detailed description. Why is it that Pepys's diary is interesting to us, he asked? It is because of its detail. But if Pepys had been a Howells, if he had been as careful in describing great things as he was in describing small things, then his diary would be ten times more valuable to us than it is. And so Howell's novels will be valuable to people who read them a thousand years from now to get an idea of how we live. That is, Howell's novels will be valuable if people read novels in the years that are to come. Perhaps they will not be reading novels or anything else. For all we know, thought transference may become as common a thing as telephony is now, and if this comes to pass, nobody will read. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Anarchists demand strike to end war. From the New York Times, dated May 19, 1917. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Anarchists demand strike to end war. Great gathering of IWW and other agitators rails against selective draft. Germans in the audience. Emma Goldman urges workers to follow Russia's lead. Police take notes, but make no arrests. The Harlem River Casino, at 126th Street and 2nd Avenue, 
was the scene last night of a wild anti-conscription demonstration in the course of which the government of the United States was denounced and referred to as a tool of the capitalist classes. Young men liable to military service under the Selective Draft Act were urged to defy the government and refuse to serve if called to the colors. A general strike on the part of all working people as a protest against the entry of the country into the European war and a nationwide campaign to frustrate the efforts of the government to raise armies for the defense of the country's rights would be among the things the future has in store for the country if those who packed the casino had their way. An appeal to the working men to follow the example of the Russians and form a working men's committee to run the country was also urged. The meeting was addressed by anarchists, IWW agitators, and persons who styled themselves socialists. Emma Goldman was one of them. Alexander Berkman, who served a term in the penitentiary for attempting to assassinate Henry C. Frick, was another. Leonard D. Abbott, well known as an IWW sympathizer, was another. Harry Weisberger, who says no power on earth can make him fight, was another. Also present and among the talkers was Leonora O'Reilly, while among those listed but who did not speak was Carlo Tresca, the Italian IWW leader, and Jacob Pankin. Outside the building and inside were about 100 policemen who had been instructed to preserve order. They made no arrests, although rumors flew about the hall that an arrest was impending, especially while Emma Goldman was talking. She was the one who predicted a nationwide strike to embarrass the government and denounce the authorities in Washington as being on a par with the old powers in Russia. She begged the audience to make no hostile demonstration should anybody try to create disorder by waving the American flag. Two police stenographers, sitting in the gallery, took down every word said by the speakers. These notes will be gone over today, and if a digest of the speeches seems to warrant it, action against the speakers may be taken, either by the police or by the federal authorities. As each person entered the hall, he or she was presented with two circulars. In one, captioned, no conscription, the No Conscription League of 20 East 125th Street exhorted young men to resist the enforcement of the selective draft. The other was an appeal to the workers of the country to follow the example of Russia and form a council of workers to act with the Council of Workmen's and Soldiers' Delegates of Russia against the war. According to the public announcement of Emma Goldman, the meeting was not financed by German money. The Kaiser, she shouted, has not put up a cent for the cause. However, there were many Germans in the audience. An interested onlooker was former coroner Gustav Scholler. Dr. Scholler had a seat in the wings of the stage, out of the view of the audience. When Elihu Root's name, as head of the American Commission to Russia, was mentioned by Emma Goldman, hisses came from every part of the hall. Weisberger, who talked first, spoke until he became so hoarse he had to quit. After him came Louis Frana, introduced as a socialist of nationwide prominence. He said the motto of all the people should from this on be, they shall not conscript. He referred to the Wilson administration as the government of the classes, which is introducing into this country a system of government which, among other things, seeks to destroy individual liberty and expression of thought. Frana said the war was not a war for democracy, but a war to protect the war profits of the ruling classes. As he spoke, somebody shouted that it was a dastardly lie to say that the United States went to war to save democracy, whereupon everybody, it seemed, shouted his or her approval. The document circulated among those in the audience calling for a workmen's council in America in part read, Fellow workers of the United States, why don't you do the same thing here that your brother workers are doing in Russia? Why shouldn't the same wonderful and heartening things that have been happening in Russia begin to happen right here? Are we workers of America going to let the workers and soldiers of Russia do the only wonderful and heartening things that are being done? President Wilson has said that America stands supremely for peace. And yet today the only place in Christendom where a single step is being taken toward peace is Russia. War has come to a standstill in Russia. The Russian workers are seeking for peace in this world. Workers of America, what are you going to do? It isn't enough for you to refuse to fight, to resist conscription, to denounce the government. It is the business of American workers to do what their Russian brothers have done. The only enemies American workers have are in America, are the men who have taken the land, who are taking enormous profits from their toil, and who have them imprisoned or shot when they rebel, as has been done in West Virginia, in Colorado, in California, in Massachusetts, 
in a thousand places where the workers have rebelled against slavery and injustice. Let the workers of the United States at once follow the heartening example of their Russian brothers and form a nationwide council of workers, which shall work hand in hand with the council of workmen and soldiers in Russia against a war that cripples or kills millions of working people and enriches a few capitalists and inaugurate here, as in Russia, the reign of freedom, justice, and peace. The purposes of the No Conscription League were set forth in its circular in part as follows. We oppose conscription because we are internationalists, anti-militarists, and opposed to all wars waged by capitalistic governments. We will fight for what we choose to fight for. We will never fight simply because we are ordered to fight. We believe that the militarization of America is an evil that far outweighs, in its anti-social and anti-libertarian effects, any good that may come from America's participation in the war. We will resist conscription by every means in our power, and we will sustain those who, for similar reasons, refuse to be conscripted. Resist conscription. Organize meetings. Join our League. Send us money. Help us to give assistance to those who come in conflict with the government. Help us to publish literature against militarism and against conscription. Other meetings similar to that of last night will be held in other parts of the city shortly, it was announced. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The Story of Harry Houdini From the New York Times, dated January 13, 1918 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett The Story of Harry Houdini Whatever the trick or tricks by which Harry Houdini has been deceiving the world at large for the last thirty-five years, his career stamps him as one of the greatest showmen of modern times. In his field Houdini stands alone. With a few minor exceptions, he has invented one and all of the countless tricks and illusions of which he is master, and he has done his job so well that not even his fellow conjurers are certain of his methods. There are, of course, certain well-established principles upon which rest the performance of a majority of tricks, but Houdini has invented principles of his own. The result is that he has no imitators. Some of his feats of extrication, of course, are attributable to the fact that he is a contortionist and an acrobat, and these, naturally, can be duplicated by others of equal physical dexterity. His more subtle effects, however, are known only to himself. His trick of vanishing an elephant, which he performed at the Hippodrome for the first time last Monday, he declares to be based upon an entirely new principle, and not merely an enlargement of the familiar cabinet trick. The management of the Hippodrome has no idea how the trick is worked. Even the stage hands who draw out the cabinet have so far failed to get a clue. With Houdini, however, are four men of his own, men whom he carries with him in season and out, and these men know something, but not everything, of his methods. Not even the keeper who disappears with the elephant, declares Houdini, knows how it is done. The elephant and the keeper are done away with by different methods, both of which are so complicated, still according to Houdini, that the elephant has just as good a chance of understanding it as the keeper. For his second hippodrome stunt, Houdini escapes from a packing box a box tightly locked and bound, which is thrown into the Hippodrome tank. This is a trick which, owing to space limitations, he never has been able to perform before on a stage, but it is similar in principle to several other of his escapes. All of these things, together with his handcuff work, etc., Houdini attributes to an inborn mechanical genius which began to manifest itself long before he knew what it was. It is this genius which, coupled with his instinct for showmanship, has given him his present undisputed position in the amusement world. His ability to do what he wanted with locks Houdini traces back to the age of five, when the family preserve closet, located in Appleton, Wisconsin, gave way readily before his very touch. Houdini, incidentally, was not his name at the time. He adopted it legally about thirty years ago. His first name was Eric. His second, for certain reasons, may not be here divulged. He was born in Appleton, as aforesaid, on April 6, 1874. He cannot remember the time when he was not an acrobat and a contortionist. At the age of seven, 
he observed a traveling showman walk a tightrope in the main street of the town, varying this feat by hanging by his teeth from the cable. Not knowing that a special mouth-fitting contrivance is required for this trick, Houdini tried it in the backyard the same afternoon, and lost five teeth. A year later, at the age of eight, he joined a five-cent circus which was showing in Appleton. At this time he was probably the mental equal of the average youth of fifteen or eighteen. His first name, Eric, fitted a circus career so well that he retained it, calling himself Eric, Prince of the Air. His act, incidentally, he called the dead man's drop. At this time, it must be remembered, he was a contortionist, acrobat, wire walker, and sleight-of-hand performer, but as yet had not developed any of his other abilities professionally. One of his tricks at this time was a variant of the contortionistic trick of bending backward and picking up an article with his mouth. Houdini went the rest several better by picking up a pen with his eye. At nine, he joined a traveling circus and toured the state as contortionist and trapeze performer. The world-famous Davenport brothers, Ira Erastus and John Henry Harrison, were then at the height of their fame, doing the first alleged spiritualistic work that the country had seen. One of their specialties was to ring bells inside a cabinet while they were bound hand and foot. They also contracted to effect an escape no matter how tightly they were bound. Houdini, hearing of their work, decided that any one physically deft could do something of the same sort, and he accordingly began to do rope escapes. Standing in the center of the ring, he would invite any one in the audience to bind him, and would then free himself inside a cabinet. When he began this work, he was about eleven. In the ring at Coffeyville, Kansas, one night, it happened to be a sheriff who tied him, and as he did so, he pulled a pair of handcuffs from his pocket. If I put these on you, you couldn't get loose, he remarked. Houdini, remembering his early experiments at home, told him to go ahead and put them on. The sheriff did so, Houdini freed himself, and his work as a handcuff expert was begun. From 1885 to 1900, he played in museums, music halls, circuses, and medicine shows all over the country, gradually improving his work and slowly discarding his purely contortionistic and acrobatic achievements. During the latter portion of this period, he played many times in New York, but never attracted any particular attention. In fact, he never attracted any. In 1900, he made his first trip abroad, purely on speculation. To interest Dundas Slater, then manager of the Alhambra, he gave a demonstration of escape from handcuffs at Scotland Yard, and succeeded in baffling the police so effectively that he was booked at the Alhambra for six months. It was at about this time that, in accordance with the custom of the times, Houdini began to call himself the Handcuff King, a phrase which afterward became world famous. Today, in a less gaudy age, it has become a phrase which he is desperately trying to live down. Houdini toured England and the continent for six years, during which time he escaped from dozens of famous prisons. Cell-breaking, incidentally, had been made compulsory with him one day when he lost the key to his hotel room and was unable to open the door. The ridicule which this happening drew down upon him led him to make a thorough study of this form of lock, with the result that he can now open practically any door with but little effort. In 1902, one of his tricks having been doubted by the police of Cologne, he demanded an apology and remained in Cologne an entire year to fight the case in the courts. He felt at the time that his career was ruined unless he obtained the apology, and eventually he got it in the name of the Kaiser. In 1901, he received a challenge from the working men of the Krupp plant at Essen and freed himself from specially constructed shackles before 70,000 people. He returned to America in 1905, bringing with him innumerable certificates and sworn statements from authorities all over Europe. He found America, Amusement America, a vastly different country from the America that he had left. Vaudeville had been organized and was under a single head, and Houdini, who had previously worked one week out of three and received thirty dollars for it, came into his own at last. In this country he continued his cell escapes, in January of 1906, breaking out of cell two in the United States jail at Washington, the cell in which Gatou had been confined. In 1908, he dropped the handcuff escapes for more dangerous feats, including an escape from an airtight galvanized vessel filled with water, which had been locked into an iron-bound chest. He also invented the so-called torture cell, in which he was bound and suspended head downward in a receptacle filled with water. 
This trick he still does upon occasions. By this time he was sufficiently skilled to do many of his escapes without any concealing device, and began to make his straitjacket escape in the open air, hanging head down from the roof of a building. This public display, of course, was designed merely to stimulate interest in his vaudeville appearances. During this period he issued a challenge to all who might think that they could invent devices to hold him, and as a result escaped from a series of plate-glass boxes, riveted iron boilers, paper bags, zinc-lined piano boxes, packing cases, padded cells, straight jackets, insane cribs, willow hampers, iron cages, burglar-proof safes, and a United States leather mail pouch. In 1912, he first performed the submarine trick now used at the Hippodrome. Manacled and nailed in a wooden packing case, which was afterward burdened with iron weights and fastened with iron clamps, he was thrown into New York Harbor just off Sandy Hook. It is more or less needless to add that he escaped. Of his quartet of confidential retainers, one of them has been with him ten years, and two of the others for eight years. Another, a German, had been in his employ fourteen years, and a parting was then necessitated by this country's entrance into the war. All of his helpers are men whom he has picked up in machine shops and trained to suit his needs. Since returning to America, Houdini has made countless trips abroad and has given shows and demonstrations in every part of Europe, Asia, and Africa. In 1910, while in Australia, he learned that the grave of John Henry Harrison Davenport, who had died in Australia, was badly kept. He saw to its rehabilitation, and upon his return to this country, he was sought out by the surviving Davenport, Ira Erastus, who in return for the good deed, gave him the secrets of their various rope tricks, some of which were still unknown to Houdini. We started it, he told the younger man. Now you finish it. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The Progress of the Film From The Guardian Unlimited Dated August 29, 1919 Recorded for LibriVox.org By Leanne Howlett The Progress of the Film Happy Endings A curious light is thrown on the psychology of picture house audiences by the fact that only recently has the first screen tragedy been completed. It is a Griffith production called Broken Blossoms, and is founded on Thomas Burke's Limehouse story, The Chink and the Child. That excellent actress, Lillian Gish, takes the leading part in it. The definition of a tragedy is a drama with an unhappy ending. A play or film may be submerged in sorrow right from the beginning, and yet if it can manage to raise its head at the last minute, it is saved from being designated a tragedy, and from consequent unpopularity. Nowadays, it is not necessary for a book to end on a note of jubilation, with the wedding march thumping close by. People like to read novels that mirror life, and in life these summits of ecstasy do not often lead to a fini. On the stage, too, an unhappy ending is suffered, though not very gladly. The kinema has no place at all for it. This is the more strange because the kinema, of all forms of entertainment, leaves the most fleeting impression behind it. The finish of a book is not immediately overlapped by the beginning of another. One leaves the theater after the final curtain drops, and many days may elapse before some other play rubs the stern lines of the tragedy from one's memory. Yet in the ordinary picture-house program the main item is wedged between a boisterous farce and the many hued interests of current events. Under such conditions no production, however effective and lovely, can hope to leave unspoiled impressions but at all costs those impressions, distorted and smudgy and faint, must be happy ones. It is the ending that matters. Tragedy, often very beautiful and poignant, is found in the middle of dozens of popular films. Hearts of the World, the new Fox version of Les Miserables, Kabiria, Maslova, and that gruesome production, The Knife, all work through a more or less piercing crescendo of agony. The Honor System, a clever propagandist film dealing with Arizona gales has many tragic episodes in it. Innumerable society and domestic dramas plunge their characters into deep and bitter waters. But none of these productions is a thoroughgoing tragedy. In the very beginning of each one there is a loophole through which one can see happiness beyond the foreground shadow. 
Your real tragedy never admits of that. Until Broken Blossoms is shown, there is no Kenema production of use as illustration, but the stage offers plenty. That Hamlet, for instance. From the first words and that wonderful first scene, the most insensitive audience is made away that no glimmer of happiness will be found in the faraway ending. As the play goes on, tragedy after tragedy wraps it round as inevitably as petals round a closing flower, and nothing but a brutal and philistine disregard for nature and art could alter its doomed progress. Up to the present, the kinema has left Hamlet alone, but the knack of giving sudden upward twists to down-going paths is one of its proudest accomplishments. It made its reputation by its last-minute averting of tragedy. Everyone remembers the old scene where the heroine dashes up in the nick of time to shoot through the rope which is about to suspend the hero by his comely neck to a stout elm tree. Something of the same idea is used in intolerance, when an automobile reaches the scaffold just as the four executioners raise their knives to sever the cords which, American fashion, work the trap. In gentler stories, heart failure or a train accident serves to clear the path of happiness for the deserving. Unpardonable sins are forgiven and apparently forgotten. A jury is sentimental. A will is found. Artificial respiration revives Ophelia, and Hamlet and she rule Denmark in peace and well-being. The kinema is perfectly at liberty to insist on cheerful endings if the subject is its own possession. To alter the conclusion of plays or novels adapted for the screen is pure vandalism and impertinence. A flaring example of this was the film version of Justice. In Galsworthy's play, Falder flings himself down a staircase and is killed. In the film, he goes back to prison and eventually sinks to the lowest grade of human life. The emendation is only less subtly tragic and is entirely inartistic. Another sufferer is Hendel Wakes. In no sense is this a tragedy. It ends reasonably and on just the right note of balance and logic. Presumably to make it more popular and less true to life, the kinema brings in a sweetheart for Fanny and the inevitable wedding bells in the distance. The thoroughly bad screen version of Temple Thurston's novel, Sally Bishop, added the sin of an altered ending to its other transgressions. In the book, the heroine commits suicide. The film makes the amount of poison she has swallowed insufficient to kill her, and she is brought to life and married to the hero or villain, according to how one regards that easy moral gentleman. It will be very interesting to see with how much favor Broken Blossoms is received. End of article this recording is in the public domain. America Dry Tonight From the Guardian Unlimited, dated January 17, 1920 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett Free Wines and Spirits Last Night, New York, Friday one minute after midnight tonight, America will become an entirely arid desert as far as alcoholics are concerned, any drinkable containing more than half of 1% alcohol being forbidden. Excessive fines and dungeon keeps yawn for transgressors of this drastic federal law. Even persons returning home with small flasks of stimulants in their pockets would be amenable to the law. The provisions of the 18th Amendment to the Constitution of the country really became effective at midnight yesterday. But in order that there should be no dispute, the federal authorities delayed their operation until tonight at midnight, as a result of which the demon rum, as it is facetiously termed, held full sway yesterday evening. Many of the most popular restaurants here and throughout the country last evening ceremoniously waked the demise of alcohol, some giving the diners free portions of whiskey, brandy, and wine, but charging goodly proportions over the usual tariffs for food and good service. At other places, plenty of clients were willing to pay for the privilege of wetting their thirst at twenty to thirty dollars for a bottle of champagne, or a dollar to two dollars for a drink of whiskey. At several places, coffins were carried throughout the rows of diners to the accompaniment of dirges. At some restaurants, the walls and ceilings were hung with crepe. Several famous restaurants had placards bearing the words, Exit Booze, Doors Close on Saturday. End of article. This recording is in the public domain.